Welcome to the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau's Advisory Committee Roundtable. My name is Ixta Martinez. I serve as the Associate Director for the External Affairs Division at the CFPB. Today's meeting is being held at the Bureau's headquarters in Washington, D.C., and is being live streamed at consumerfinance.gov. A recording will be made available on the Bureau's website. You can also follow the Bureau on social media via Facebook and Twitter. In a few moments, I'll turn to Andrew Duke, who will kick off the meeting and introduce Director Kraninger. But first, I'd like to welcome our advisory committee members and introduce individuals who are serving on the Bureau's Advisory Board, or CAB, the Community Bank Advisory Council, or CBAC, and the Credit Union Advisory Council, or QAC, during the fiscal year 2019 cycle. Members, when I call your name, please raise your hand. On our Consumer Advisory Board, the CAB Chair is Dr. Ronald Johnson. Dr. Johnson is the former president of Clark Atlanta University in Atlanta, Georgia. Liz Coyle is the Executive Director of Georgia Watch in Atlanta, Georgia. Sammy Elamui is the Chief Executive Officer of Scratch Services in San Francisco, California. Manning Field is the Chief Operating Officer of Acorns in Irvine, California. Jason Gross is the Chief Executive Officer of Petal in New York City. Brent Neiser is the Senior Director of Strategic Programs and Alliances at the National Endowment for Financial Education in Denver, Colorado. Luz Urrutia is the Chief Executive Officer of Opportunity Fund in San Jose, California. On our Community Bank Advisor Council, the CBAC Chair is Maureen Bush. She is the Vice President of Compliance and CRA Officer of the Bank of Tampa in Tampa, Florida. Eric Began is the Founder, CEO, and President of Austin Capital Bank in Austin, Texas. Brian Bruns is the President and CEO of Lake Central Bank in Annandale, Minnesota. Michael Head is the President, CEO, and Director of First Federal Savings Bank in Evansville, Indiana. Aubrey Hulings is the Vice President and Operations Manager for the Farmers National Bank of Emlinton in Emlinton, Pennsylvania. Heidi Sexton is the Executive Vice President and Chief Compliance and Risk Officer of Sound Community Bank in Seattle, Washington. Jeannie Stahl is the Senior Vice President and Chief Risk and Compliance Officer of MetaBank in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. On our Credit Union Advisory Council, the QAC Chair is Rick Schmidt. He is President and CEO of West Star Credit Union in Las Vegas, Nevada. Arlene Babwa is the Vice President of Risk Management at Coastal Federal Credit Union in Raleigh, North Carolina. Sean Cahill is the President and CEO of True Sky Credit Union in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. Christopher Court is Vice President of Accounting and Operations for Service at Service First Credit Union in Danville, Pennsylvania. Teresa Campbell is President and CEO of San Diego County Credit Union in San Diego, California. James Hunsinger is Chief Risk Officer of Michigan State University Federal Credit Union in East Lansing, Michigan. Brian Price is the President and CEO of Indiana University Credit Union in Bloomington, Indiana. We also have with us Brian Johnson, Acting Deputy Director for the Bureau, and Matt Cameron, Acting Staff Director for the Office of Advisory Board and Councils. I'm now pleased to introduce Andrew Duke. He serves as the Policy Associate Director for External Affairs and brings 27 years of experience in public policy, including 20 years on Capitol Hill, serving with three different members of Congress. He received his BA in Economics from Hamden Sydney College in Virginia. Andrew?
Thank you, Zixta. Uh, it's an honor to be here with you all this afternoon, and I'm looking forward to a productive discussion. My name is Andrew Duke, and I serve as the Policy Associate Director for the External Affairs Division here at the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. I'd like to thank all of our advisory committee members for agreeing to serve in this capacity to help advise the leadership of the CFPB and its director on a broad range of consumer financial issues and emerging market trends. Following for those live streaming, let me just share a brief overview of our schedule today. Following the director's remarks, CBAC Chair Maureen Bush will conduct the meeting. Chair Bush will introduce Bureau subject matter experts for a discussion on the Bureau's Start Small, Save Up initiative. After that discussion, she will then introduce Bureau subject matter experts for a discussion on the Bureau's recently announced advance notice of proposed rulemaking on property assessed clean energy financing. Then she will welcome Bureau subject matter experts from the Office of Service Member Affairs to discuss the work of their office and demo the Misadventures in Money Management tool. At approximately 5.15 p.m., the roundtable will adjourn. As background, the CFPB established its advisory committees to provide substantive information analysis, operational expertise, knowledge, of their communities and feedback to inform the Bureau's work. As a reminder, the views of the advisory committee members are their views. They are, not, they are greatly appreciated and welcome, yet they do not represent the views of the Bureau. I'm now pleased to introduce Director Kathy Craniger. Director Craniger became the second confirmed director of the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau in December 2018. From her early days as a Peace Corps volunteer to her role establishing the Department of Homeland Security to her policy work at the Office of Management and Budget to the CFPB, Director Craniger has dedicated her career to public service. It is my privilege to welcome her to today's roundtable meeting. Director, the floor is yours. Good afternoon. My thanks to all of you for joining us today. I'd like to extend a particular appreciation to Dr. Ronald Johnson, to Maureen Bush, and to Rick Schmidt for serving as chairs of their respective advisory committees. Thank you for your dedication and commitment to steering these important groups. The Bureau's advisory committees play an important role in helping, our, helping us improve our work and better protect consumers in the financial marketplace. So I'm glad that you have volunteered to share your perspectives with us. As you know, I have focused on outreach to all Bureau stakeholders in my first three months as director through my listening tour. Holding roundtables and meetings with the broad panoply of stakeholders that this agency has, uh, including those of you represented here from community banks, credit unions, consumer advocates, uh, non-financial lenders, innovators, uh, members of Congress, the media, uh, and I'm always in, in trouble with not mentioning every single one of them along the way, uh, but, but educators as well. Uh, there are many people who care about the important work that we do and have, a, uh, to have the opportunity to contribute to the important work that we do as well. So it is critically important to me to hear all of their perspectives, that they can bring the best thinking to how we deliver our mission on behalf of consumers. My meetings, though, with the current uh, and former advisory board members have been especially helpful. You gave me insights on changes to make to the committees and to make them more robust and a more useful resource to the Bureau. This feedback included how often we should meet, what we should focus on, the application and selection process for new members and how long they should serve, and the committee's operating structure. Advisory committee members are a diverse group who help us identify key issues around the country and broaden our outlook on the landscape of consumer financial protection. I look forward to continuing our dialogue on ways to better protect consumers. Looking ahead, I will be setting priorities for the Bureau, and I'm looking at, at a philosophy around prevention of harm, as some of us have, have spoken. Um, and that, that really includes using all of the tools 
that Congress gave to the Bureau in exercising that responsibility. Uh, we need to ensure that Americans are protected from harmful and unlawful practices in the financial sphere, that consumers have access to the financial products and services that best suit their individual needs, that financial institutions that serve consumers are competing honestly on a level playing field, and that we foster diversity and inclusion within the agency and outside with our stakeholders. And last, that the marketplace can innovate to give consumers more and better choices. One key way the Bureau meets many of those goals is through its financial education mission. And as Andrew noted, we are going to talk uh, next about the Start Small, Save Up initiative that we recently announced. Uh, the Start so Small, Save Up initiative offers tips, tools, and information to help consumers build a basic savings cushion and a saving habit. We are encouraging consumers to start and maintain an emergency savings account to handle unplanned expenses. And you can find details on the consumerfinance.gov website to this end. We launched the initiative at the end of last month during America Saves Week, and the need is clear. Many people can't afford to buy a house, and even those who can typically have to save for seven years to accumulate a 20% down payment on a home. Fewer than half of Americans set aside money for their children's college education. An increasing number of people reach retirement with incomes and savings that fall far short of meeting their needs. And a recent study found that 40% of adults lack enough liquid savings to cover even a $400 emergency expense. But our research tells us that even small amounts of money saved can make a big difference in our financial well-being. Savings in addition to manageable debt and good credit are cornerstones of financial well-being. And I really look forward to that conversation and, and hearing your perspectives on it because key to this initiative and the way that the Bureau is going to operate going forward is in partnership. We can't succeed without the breadth and, and reach of the partners that we're working with on these issues. And I very much appreciate your insights on this topic and, and all of the others that, that we've been discussing. So thank you again for being here. Thank you, Director. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Maureen Bush, and I serve as chair of the Bureau's Community Bank Advisory Council, or CBAC. It is great to be here in Washington, D.C. at the Bureau's headquarters for this important roundtable. I'm pleased to be joined by my colleagues from the Consumer Advisory Board, Community Bank Advisory Council, and Credit Union Advisory Council. As chair of the CBAC, I have been asked by the Bureau to help moderate this afternoon's discussions. My colleagues, Dr. Ron Johnson, chair of the CAB, sh chaired our September meeting, and Rick Schmidt, chair of the QAC, chaired the December conference call. First, on behalf of the advisory committees, I'd like to welcome Director Kraninger to this meeting and congratulate her on her appointment to lead this important agency for consumers and the financial marketplace. The director has been very busy, and I must applaud her for addressing the Bureau's name and embarking on her listening tour. I can't think of a better way to understand the full landscape of the Bureau's work than heading across the country to hear from stakeholders about the Bureau's work. I personally had the opportunity to attend one of the listening sessions in Chicago, and I was impressed by her willingness to tackle the tough issues at hand and spend time just listening. So thank you, Director, for having us all here, and I look forward to our continued discussions. Today's meeting will focus on three important topics, as such as the Director's Start Small, Save Up initiative, PACE financing, and financial education for service members. So let's begin with our first session related to the Director's Start Small, Save Up initiative and its work related to financial education. With us, we are joined by Yannicka Ratcliffe, Assistant Director for the Bureau's Office of Financial Education, and Jean Koo, Assistant Director for Consumer Engagement. Thank you for joining us, and I'll turn the session over to you. Okay, great. Thank you, Chairwoman Bush, and all of you for your attention to the issue of savings. We look forward to hearing from you on this topic today. But first, Jean and I are pleased to uh, to have the opportunity to set up your discussion by briefly sharing some research and some resources that the Bureau has related to the Start Small, Save Up initiative that the Director announced this past America Saves Week. 
So uh, I'm going to start by going to our uh, definition of uh, financial well-being and what it means to consumers. We started this research by listening to consumers' own words to understand what financial well-being means to them. We learned, of course, that it looks different from person to person. But throughout the discussions and interviews we conducted, there were four common elements that emerged. So you can see them here on the slide. In the present, there's a sense of a control over day-to-day, month-to-month finances, in the sense of security, and then in the sense of freedom, of financial freedom of choice, there's the freedom to make choices to enjoy life on a daily basis, whether that's to buy a, a new pair of shoes or a big vacation somewhere. It varies from person to person. And then looking in the future, the security comes from a sense of having the capacity to absorb an unexpected financial expense and a sense of being on track to meet your long-term financial goals. Um, things that bring long-term quality of life, be that higher education or home ownership or a secure retirement. So uh, you can see here how important savings is to especially those two boxes on the far right side. With the help of measurement experts, we then created a reliable scale to measure people's financial well-being, and we did a nationally representative survey. Here's a snapshot of some of the results. It shows that the average financial well-being score in the country was 54, um, and it also shows that there was a very wide but normal distribution around the average. We use the survey data to find out what factors are related to people having higher or lower financial well-being, things like income and age and financial knowledge, um, financial factors, and all kinds of other uh, elements. Of all the factors that we examined, disparities in financial well-being were greatest between subgroups of people having different levels of liquid savings. So what this chart shows is that having savings of $250 or less is associated with uh, fairly low levels of financial well-being um, and, and it's not shown here but constant struggles to make ends meet. And then if you keep going up the scale, each small incremental increase in liquid savings is associated with a significant improvement in financial well-being. Our survey also uncovered some sobering statistics about people's savings levels and behaviors. Uh, only about less than 60% of adults said that they actually know how to save. Uh, just over, only over half reported having a habit of savings. And we found that 20% of the respondents uh, had less than $250 in liquid savings. So our survey showed that liquid savings is strongly related to financial well-being, even small amounts, and that there are a lot of people out there struggling to get there. Um, so this is there's a lot going on in this slide, but let me uh, have you first focus on the boxes at the top of the slide. Uh, we use the data from the survey to examine how financial education might affect financial well-being. The findings suggest that uh, the financial education can help consumers improve their financial situation. So that's their sense of financial well-being as well as their objective financial situation, which are the boxes on the far right, by helping them to improve their financial skill and financial behavior, which are the boxes on the left. Financial skill is about knowing how to do specific things. Having higher levels of financial skill was in turn connected with reporting higher levels of doing specific actions, taking specific financial actions that in turn were associated with having a better financial, actual objective financial situation, which is things like savings, credit score, along, things along those lines. And finally, financial well-being was, was a good reflection of people's actual factual objective financial situation. So the, the boxes below that kind of illustrate how this model applies specifically to the question of savings. Working from the uh, right to the left, the amount of savings a person reported was strongly and significantly related to their sense of financial well-being. Next step over, people who reported having a habit of saving, not surprisingly actually, um, were more likely to have higher amounts saved. And so the evidence suggests that financial education can help people save by helping them build these skills to save. This is less about teaching them how to calculate compound interest or diversify a portfolio. It's more about the how to get started and how to stick with it, or um, as we say here, uh, start small and save up. 
To complement this qualitative uh, research, I also wanted to share some findings we've had from the field as we've been developing tools to help people save and testing those tools with financial educators. These are just anecdotal feedback um, that shows some of the obstacles people face in, in saving. There's, of course, a lot of factors like lack of income and income volatility in there, but you can also see the theme of skills and how-to as well as the theme of emergencies and how they um, throw people off track. And then the director already mentioned these statistics, these sobering data about uh, the state of savings in this country, both the short term as well as the, um, the challenges for, for saving for things like college education, buying a home, and a secure retirement. So all the research I've just presented underscores the importance of helping people start small and save up. And Jean is going to share what resources the Bureau has available. Thank you, and, and thank you again for offering us this time to help frame this very important discussion. Um, uh, I'm Jean Ku. I'm serving as the Assistant Director of the Office of Consumer Engagement. Um, and in support of this initiative, we were very pleased to have launched the website you see in front of you, uh, this web page that uh, defines our Start Small, Save Up initiative. And on it, uh, we link to all the resources that we've already created in the past and uh, that pertain to helping consumers um, save. And think of this as the first of many new resources that we'll, we'll be developing in support of this initiative, uh, sort of a down payment on this entire effort. Um, so to help frame the conversation that I hope we're about to have, I want to just give a quick overview of our educational engagement approach and show how that approach informs our Start Small, Save Up strategy. Um, the research that our office has done shows that the audiences that we engage at the Bureau kind of break down into two different groups. There are people who are dealing with an immediate problem, and their goal is to fix it. Um, and then there are other folks who have a dream, um, and their goal is to, help, is to help figure out how to plan for that dream. So there's these two different audiences that we can reach, and that leads to two different approaches to reaching those mindsets. The planners, as you can imagine, are kind of the low-hanging fruit. These are folks who already want to take control of their financial lives. They're just looking for help uh, in doing so. And so for this audience, the goal is to connect saving to their planning goal, uh, whether that goal is to pass on financial skills to their kids, such as you see on your right here, Money As You Grow is a uh, program and offering we have for parents and caregivers, um, or whether it's to buy a house, uh, save for retirement, save for college. The bigger and often more difficult challenge is reaching people who um, need to reach that fixed mode. And people in this mode are often um, panicking, scrambling. They've just been hit with some kind of problem, some kind of crisis, and they need to know what to do. You won't be surprised to hear that the majority of people coming to our website are people who are in this mode. They're what we call trying to get to fix. And so our challenge for these folks is how to move people along the spectrum from panicking and scrambling because something just happened to getting them to fix that problem. And then from there, start thinking about planning ahead so they don't have that problem again. And often emergency savings is one of the key components to preventing a future emergency. Um, so showing them how saving is part of that um, long-term solution. Um, and it's not just our website that's doing this. We also have uh, lots of organizations that we work with that are reaching people, uh, organizations like social work organizations, that are reaching people who are in that crisis moment and are helping them get out of that crisis, but from that moment also leading them to a better place where they can be thinking ahead and planning ahead. So connecting consumers to the savings message also requires reaching people at opportune moments. Um, so what you see in front of you is um, some of the website resources we have related to our um, program on tax time savings. And so being able to reach people when they have money to save or um, people who, in a sense, have hit bottom and in their struggles with debt and are looking for solutions and are open to messages such as, let's put together that emergency savings plan. Um, but wouldn't it be great also if we could take that single moment in time when, when people are open to suggestions and turn it into a lifetime of moments? So one of the things that, that Yannick was describing is um, how do we develop a habit of savings? And then also how do we encourage people to sign up for automatic savings? So that one moment in time when you say, I want to save, becomes a continuous process rather than constantly re-engaging people over and over again to save, 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 save. 
And finally, um, something, something additional to consider as we uh, have this conversation is that there probably is not a one-size-fits-all solution for how we would talk to the American public. Um, for example, we found uh, in our research previously when we were looking at, at home buying um, that uh, Spanish-speaking Americans were disproportionately interested in buying a home, but also disproportionately had lower credit and less engagement with the formal financial institutions of, of banking than, uh, than other Americans. And so we realized there was a special opportunity to reach those folks with resources tailored to them and uh, a great way to then connect with why people need to build up savings for that down payment moment. Um, so perhaps one thing that we'd especially appreciate is your perspectives on this diversity of the American consumer um, and how we can address uh, all the different types of folks that are out there in terms of how we can connect them with this, the message of savings. Thank you. So I'll just add that uh, we're here to hear from you now that you've heard from us. So I will turn it back over to the chair for the discussion period. Thank you very much, Yannicka and Jean. This is certainly an important issue for us to address. And to begin the conversation, I wanted to pose a couple of questions to the group. One is, what strategies and approaches do you use to help consumers in establishing savings? And then with that, how do you measure the success of these strategies and what lessons have been learned? I'd like to open it up. Thank you very much, um, Director Kaninger. Thank you, and congratulations on the new position and thank you for bringing focus on this particularly important issue. Um, you know, at Acorns, this is exactly what we do. You know, we really are focused on helping everyday Americans save and invest every day. And actually, the idea of starting small is embedded in our name. It's an acorn that we intend to have people grow into a mighty oak and a tree. And so um, the strategies, you know, to answer your question, Maureen, the strategies that we use is that we actually use automation. We use a digital-only experience. We use simple design. And we embed education to build a confidence along the way. So all as the customer is engaging and as customers start to build up this balance, whether they're planning or whether they're in kind of trying to address a, a core issue, as Gene said, um, it really is giving them a sense of progress and understanding how things work. And, and from a messaging standpoint, from a brand standpoint, we're very optimistic. And we are about uplifting and trying to be very, very optimistic um, because confidence is core to solving the problem. So I really appreciate all of the work that the team's done to kind of bring this forward and push this important agenda out. Um, I do have some feedback, though, um, and maybe some strategies that I would share. As I've, as I've gone through kind of the experience, I think the content and, and the substance is really important and of extremely high quality. I do think when you try to reach a, an audience, um, that you need to be really thinking in a digital way. And though it is it's a beautifully designed website, it's not very mobile friendly. Um, and I think that that is something that I would encourage you to look at. Um, for example, if you go log in, all of your plans, your tools, those, those great like, kind of worksheets that you've created, what happens is, is it spawns into a PDF, which then someone on a mobile phone, which 90% of our customers, that's the only way in which they interact with us, um, it requires you to either pinch or print. Um, so uh, my concern is that you might lose people in a moment where they need help or they need to make it feel like it's really easy to get started, that you make it a little bit more difficult for them to do that. So that's one piece of feedback that I would encourage you to address. Another piece of feedback that I encourage you to address is really about distribution and the partnerships that you've suggested um, I think are right. But I would also encourage you to look through other digital distribution methods like search engine optimization and so forth. If you go search for savings, how do I save? How do I get started? I need help. Uh, your content is, is not there. And so I would encourage you to use techniques in search engine optimization to improve that. So you Im improve uh, your reach of your message. Um, and the last one really is about the partnership that the director mentioned. Um, and and we sh I share that thought, um, and we at Acorn share that thought. But I think you would, I would encourage you to consider ways in which to get this information, this content, distributed through whether the APIs or some type of content syndication, so that the ecosystem, from big to small, can consume that content, integrate it into their experience. Because you haven't copyrighted this. You've made it accessible to everybody. So I think making it only available through your website as the starting point, I think, limits the opportunity to make an impact. So I would encourage you to think about you know, sophisticated ways in which to do digital distribution with the ecosystem. Thank you very much. Liz? Liz? Thank you. Thank you, Danny. <clears throat> Excuse okay. me. I had a question back for you. The, the, the one statistic that to me was the most sobering in the entire presentation 
57 percent of Americans don't know how to save. So um, it's actually that only 57 percent reported that they know how to save. That they know how to save. So how are you defining when you say they know how to save? What does that mean? Well, that's part of what we're trying to unpack here. I mean, I think, uh, you know, again, I would love to hear from the, um, the advisory boards and councils about the sort of obstacles and sense of what do people, you know, it is a skill. How to, some of it may be, this is just me conjecturing, but some of it may be, how do I peel enough out of my monthly cash flow to put something aside? Some of it may be, how do I... Where do I put them physically? Where do I save? How, how to save, you know? So I think that there's some, uh, more for us to be looking into, and I think some folks here who have had some experience with education or with working with um, clients might have some insights. So when you, so we're saying that people that in theory may not know how to budget or they may not have enough income in order to set aside, you know, $10 a paycheck or $100 a paycheck or whatever the case may be in order to start building that nest egg. Yeah, another some more complexity also, I think, around... What does it mean to save? As you saw people say, emergencies wipe me out. Mm -hmm. Well, we might argue that that worked then, right? You had some money set aside, something came up, you were able to cover it without derailing yourself financially or without having to borrow. So you, but you have no savings left. Now, is that a, is that a success? I could argue that it is, but people might feel like, oh, it's so hard to save. What do I do when unexpected arises? Well, one of the things, and I know a lot of credit unions, and my credit in particular, we're working on a program called Bonsai to do financial literacy in the in schools. So we focus on middle schools and high schools to give them basic financial skills, how to, not necessarily as Dr. Johnson said, to balance a checkbook because, you know, most of them probably will never see a checkbook in their life, um, but how to basic financial management tools and how to budget, um, you know, how to... You know, if you're getting $200 a week on a, on a part-time job, how do you budget that, et cetera? Um, so we, we try very hard to do those type of things. So I think that, you know, when you have such a large portion of the population that is that, that essentially is claiming that they are financially illiterate, um, that starting those type of programs and, and supporting those um, is probably where it needs to begin so that, you know, coming out of school, you know, I have – a son in college and a son who's about to go into college and trying to make sure that they embark when they're now on their own and can actually function in society on their own is probably the first step, whether you're going to college or not, or, you know, whatever it is that you're doing once you're leaving the nest. So I would encourage that any sort of programs that banks, credit unions, um, the consumer advocacy groups can do to, to promote financial literacy is probably the, the baseline for getting these type of programs up and running. Liz. Thank you, Maureen. Um, and uh, thank you, Yannicka and Jean, for an excellent presentation. Um, I, I first, I didn't see in the presentation evidence <coughs> that the data was um, aggregated demographically. Uh, ha have you done that? And, and if so, um, is there a reason that that wasn't presented today? And then I wanted to follow up on it with a comment about that. Yeah, we do have uh, demographic breakouts. I don't have um, demographic breakouts by demographics of savings and demographics, a crosstab of that available. Um, we, it, we do have a publicly available data set. Mm -hmm. So we are inviting people to use the data we collected to look into these issues and to help us you know, kind of dig into them all. Um, and then uh, also we had a 10 minute <laughs> window to, to speak to you sure. today and wanted to. Sure. But I just, I wanted to ask that because while I didn't see it in the presentation and I, I, I thought you probably had, had done some of that, I want to point out that what we're talking about is really wealth building. And I want to um, have us acknowledge that we have a, a tremendous racial wealth gap in this country. And the issues around savings and handling, having enough money for an emergency is really um, much different uh, for a um, low-income community of color than a lower-income white community, for example. And so I do think it's important as um, solutions are designed that we are very specific and intentional about tr working to close the racial wealth gap. Um, I will tell you that there are some um, 
you know, old tried and true methods that I, I'm hearing about uh, kind of resurfacing. Some of you know about, or maybe you all know about, individual development accounts, IDAs. Some states offer those. George is not one that offers, but our United Way is beginning to. Prosperity Now is a national organization that's working to encourage that. And it really is giving some additional um, incentive so that when you set aside some money, there's some kind of a match to help it grow. Uh, I think it's also important for us to frame or perhaps redefine what an emergency is for people. Um, we have um, we have a toll-free consumer hotline, and the number one call we get is from people who have um, a medical bill that is maybe a surprise medical bill because they didn't know they were going to an out-of-network anesthesiologist. Um, we had one consumer with a $30,000 unexpected medical bill and uh, lived in stress for two years not knowing how she could possibly pay it. Um, and we were able to help her see what her options were, and she reduced that debt to zero. So really, I, I think it's important that we address it from um, – it, it, certainly it's important for people to know how to save if they don't know how to save. Also, you know, a lot of um, people face um, – long-term student debt these days, uh, helping people learn to manage the, if you're going to, if your student loan is this much and you have to make this payment every month, then, you know, plan to set aside this month, this much, you know, some percentage of whatever that, that monthly payment is. Um, and um, um, I, I think one, one final point I'd, I'd like to make in this space is that we know certainly that when people have that emergency, that is when they're going to take out an, a possibly a, a predatory loan and get trapped in a cycle of debt. Um, and we think it's really important to continue to look at alternatives to a payday or title pawn loan. Uh, there are emerging employer-based, um, I think even Walmart now, has a, 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 an alternative to a payday loan that you've worked this many days this month and you can access your paycheck early. A couple of other, uh, there's, a, I think the city of Phoenix has that now for their employees. So I think we have to have a multi-part strategies um, to give people more than just education, but specific supports to help them with their savings. Thank you, Jim. And then Sama, we'll get to you. And yes. <clears throat> I'd like to share a few things that we're doing at Michigan State University Federal Credit Union as it relates to savings. So we're a uh, $4.2 billion credit union in East Lansing, Michigan, and we primarily serve the Michigan State University and Oakland University um, campuses. And we have a we have a heavy focus. I, I love the education pathway that you've defined, um, and we have a heavy focus on on building that financial skill. So it builds that financial behavior, especially with with students um, pre college and, and into college. And so <clears throat> we have a we have a financial education department at our credit union, which consists of five individuals whose full time job is to provide financial education seminars uh, to our members and to the public. Uh, that are focused at all phases of uh, individual's lifestyle, so or individual's life, to to give them the um, understanding of what they may need to do at the different phases of life from a savings budgeting standpoint, so that they can achieve their financial goals uh, throughout life. Um, and that has been exceptionally beneficial. They do hundreds of uh, presentations a year um, that are free and available, like I said, to the members and the public. Uh, we also uh, have a it's a financial 4.0 blog that. Is we have uh, interns from Michigan State University and Oakland University um, that uh, help par participate and be providers for this blog. Um, that because they're they're the ones at that age that are um, experiencing different challenges as it relates to getting their um, financial foundation set um, for their future. And so um, having them provide relatable content. Uh, in that blog has been very well received by our members, especially uh, our student members uh, that we're trying to serve. Uh, we have a variety of youth accounts also that we have set up uh, what we, we use the term gamification. And so they have uh, different goals that they can earn credits to. There are five different tiers in our youth accounts um, that you move into from an age standpoint. And the uh, goal there is uh, I guess relates to your education pathway and revealing that financial skill and that financial behavior at a young age so that our next generation mm -hmm. of savers can have a solid foundation um, moving forward. And then, um, you know, we are always encouraging and our team encourages auto transfers for into savings accounts uh, from their checking account, especially if they have direct deposit in order to help them um, have that, again, savings running in the background. And we train all of our uh, 
uh, financial service representatives that are engaging with our members uh, on how to have those conversations and when to recognize and identify our members that need uh, uh, or that could benefit from having the savings uh, auto transfers in the background. So, Thank you, Jim. Sima? Hi, this is Samuel Amali from Scratch. Uh, while financial literacy or even gamification feels like the most actionable thing, it's not clear from the data just how correlated the function of your propensity to save with your ability to save, aka even having the net disposable income to save one dollar. Like most folks are already just struggling to kind of the initial problem of lining up your expenses with when your income comes in, kind of building on what Liz is saying. And the idea of saving is really much further up the pyramid of what your needs are right now, what you're trying to solve. And there seems to be that first fundamental problem before you're even considering how to save. Luz. Sorry, Luz. Thank you. Thank you. So a um, couple of comments. I first commend the Bureau for tackling such a huge problem in America. Um, we went through the, the website in, in detail and um, very valuable for uh, mostly for consumers that, you know, have employment. I think that, you know, since the Great Recession, we have had a significant number of, you know, small business entrepreneurs in the gig economy and consider, uh, you know, recommendation to the Bureau to design worksheets because a lot of consumers these days are matching a variety of sources of income to make ends meet. So think about, you know, how can you help consumers across the board, not just, you know, W-2, but also others. Um, on the tax side, I think that's a, a very valuable uh, approach. I think that part of educating for savings is also making consumer aware, consumers aware of products that strip wealth. And so education on the risks and costs of certain products that happen at tax time, like, you know, the refund, anticipation loans, and other products uh, would be good for the, the consumers to, to, to have access to. And then when you talk about obstacles, I think, to Sammy's point, you know, there's sort of like hierarchy and, you know, what what there are many reasons why consumers don't save, right? One of them is they are overspending or lack of financial education or lack of discipline or too much debt. And so having treatment and, you know, recommended approaches um, for each one of those so that it doesn't look as such an insurmountable, like, where do I begin, is sort of paring down, you know, why am I where I am? And then from there, how do I begin? Thank you, Luz. Um, uh, we'll do Sean first and then Brent, you. Thank you. Sean Cale, True Sky Credit Union. Uh, first, Director, commend you on this program. I think it's a fantastic program. And Yannick, a great presentation today. Uh, I want to touch on a little bit of Liz's comments around, uh, you know, some of the barriers to, to savings. And, uh, you know, we, we have a program called the Borrow and Save Loan, where uh, we know that bad things happen to good people. We know that this unexpected of expense of $400 what that might do to uh, the average consumer. And what we do is we offer a product where they can get an alternative to a payday loan and a portion of that 25% goes into a savings account. So it's not just addressing the immediate concern that uh, the member's gotta fix their car or their, their air has gone out or something has happened, but to develop savings behaviors and have something at the end of that. And we teach those savings behaviors and have conversations with the consumer about that. And then first, if something else comes up, they can go to their savings first and, and, and break that, that payday loan cycle. But also there's great pride in having a savings account when they're done with this process. So we're looking to continually build on this. In fact, we were just meeting with one of the large employers in, in Oklahoma, employs thousands of Oklahomans, and we're talking about some of our savings programs and financial literacy and, and education to develop savings behaviors and, and talking to the CEO, COO, CFO, they said, Sean, you know, we employ so many of our, our entry level workers, right? Savings isn't the problem. More than 10% of our employees have garnishments on their accounts from payday lenders. So before they can get to a savings behavior, we've got to take care of this first. So we're working with them on financial literacy and financial education 
to get past that part before they can even get to the savings behavior. So there, there are significant barriers to uh, everyone wants to save, but they sometimes they just can't. They've got to get past that. Thank you. Uh, Director Yannicka and Jean, uh, thank you for this great effort. I've got four points. I'll move quickly. The first is the idea of personas. Uh, our foundation did this in the just after the Great Recession started. We were trying to find a new way to engage people that were hurting uh, and to help them with unique and sometimes non-traditional strategies dealing with preparing for job changes, housing and mortgage and credit and debt. Those were our topical target areas but we tried to target people's emotional state. And here were the four we sliced it. First was in financial trouble. Second, facing tough times. Three, scared about the economy. And four, getting back on track, that I've maybe been reemployed, et cetera. And that we had high engagement on that level. And that was under something we called economic survival tips. Uh, the second area is to leverage off something that many employees are encountering in the new state savings initiatives like Oregon Saves and the, the new one in California are causing people that never had access to retirement savings to suddenly come face to face with that with auto enrollment. And I think there's an opportunity to teach emergency fund savings alongside the act of defer, delayed gratification for a big goal like retirement. And I know there are a lot of thinkers at um, Brookings Foundation, Brookings Institution, and others thinking about sidecar accounts or rainy day savings to a company through an employee system, employer system, retirement savings. So that's that's the second point. And the third is something a lot of you don't know about. It's the FAA rule on savings. It's called put your oxygen mask first. Put your oxygen mask on first before helping others. And this is the idea of for families that are a bit intrusive to people who have a propensity to save or maybe some good employment, they're often tapping into that, that pool of money that, that individuals are creating or a couple's creating. But the idea of save for yourself first, you'll be better, off, better able to help others later. And finally, on the tax side, and we, our, our group has worked with IRS spec before, I don't know if there's a way to um, go down Pennsylvania Avenue to the IRS to say, could we add a supplemental name to IRS Form 8888? You know, actually put English language or Spanish language wording that says what it is actually for to get people to say, I want that. Thank you, Brian, and then Eric. Okay. Uh, yeah, I, the one I'm, I applaud the program. I think it's great. We, I think most of us have been working on some type of initiatives in our own shops. But I, you know, back to your point, Liz, for a second. Just I think the, to try and figure out the the major difference and kind of what Brent you said too. The the big emergency, I don't think you can necessarily fix in a program like this, because in my um, area, I know people that make, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars a year and don't have anything to in savings at all. I also know people that make $30,000 a year that have six months or more put away in savings. And so it is more of a habit type forming thing. The conversations that we have sometimes when people get in trouble, not the emergency thing, but the, the more trending things, you, you, if you look at their accounts, they're, they still have the, the stuff that's not fun to talk about, but it is the they still have the 400 channels on their cable TV that they have to have. They, they, if you look at the, all the gaming things that they're paying for in their social media accounts, they're bored at home and all of a sudden they're playing, it's $5 here, $10 here. By the time we add it up for the customers and show them, they're spending $50 a month on things that they could just stop if they turned their phone off and went outside. And so those are things that are not going to cover the $30,000 without a doubt. But I think trying to educate those consumers of what is really a need versus a want is, is something that's really important. Uh, Eric Beckman, Austin Capital Bank. Uh, in, in our fintech initiatives, we focus on products and services that can create, grow, or preserve wealth at the individual, family, or community level. Uh, and, and somebody made the point that it's not just savings, but it's wealth creation. And so if you look at wealth creation, you can build savings or wealth by two different manners, either reducing expenses or increasing savings or a combination of both. 
Uh, and so we recently launched our flagship product, which is a Credit Strong account, which is a fusion of an installment loan and FDIC insured savings account, and, and really tackling this issue of the vicious cycle of high cost debt and no savings, which prevents people from uh, using traditional methods, say a secured card where they have to have money up front uh, to actually improve their savings to get a lower cost of debt. Uh, and so uh, with this product, you can start with you know, no money down, uh, just a small admin fee to get started. Uh, and in 12 or 24 months, the consumer will have an improved credit profile and they'll have between $500 and $2,000 uh, in a savings account set aside for them. Uh, if they need those funds at any time during that account, uh, we made it very consumer friendly in that there's no prepayment penalty and there's no early withdrawal fee so they can access the funds. But we try to, not, we, we don't lower the, uh, the, the lock on the savings account over the life of the account because we don't keep people dipping in for wants, you know, versus, uh, versus true needs. Um, and, and to echo uh, 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 Manning's comments, uh, really needing to meet the consumer, you know, where they are, how they want to be met, and when they want to be met. So for this product, it, it's nationwide. There's, there's credit builder loans, but those have been restricted typically by membership requirements or geographies. So it's nationwide, 47 states. Uh, 80 to 85% of users are mobile. And most of our uh, new accounts are between 3 p.m. and 3 a.m. Manning? Sorry. Just one extra comment. Um, you know, I, I think we get caught in sometimes in this kind of chicken or the egg kind of conversation of like, do they handle all their obligations first before they start to put money away? Are they ready to have a conversation? Um, and I, I would say, at least in my experience, um, if you approach it in a purely rational way, that you might actually never get the customer there because it's just for many for many situations, it's just it's hard to see the light at the end of the tunnel. And so what I think you need to do, and what we all have to consider, is how do you give them a sense of early progress? Whether that progress may or, not, may or may not be meaningfully rational, may or may not cover that emergency, but give them the sense of progress because what you really want to do with that sense of progress is it opens up a conversation around education and having the deeper things. And you know some of the programs that Jim was talking about I think is a good, good example of that. But it's really how do you open that conversation? And I, my position is that progress and a feeling of optimism and a feeling of progress is, is critical to driving that conversation. When I guess I just had a kind of a follow-up question, and I, I again I looked through the materials and I thought they were very well done. But one of my questions was in putting this presentation together: Did you have conversations with consumers and really uh, find out from them how they want to be approached about savings? Um, my gut feeling is a lot like Sean's in that. Uh, uh, you know, there's no one size fits all, and again, anyone trying to do anything is, is great, but that it, our consumers kind of want small touches. You know, they don't want to be talked down to, they don't want to be told, they don't need their Netflix account, they don't want to be told those things, but if you can find little touch points along the way in a loan, lending relationship, in other aspects of your relationship just to entice them. It may be through incentives. We have a prepaid card program that has a 5% savings rate up to $5,000. Um, you'd be surprised how many people don't use that program, right? Um, but if you can just somewhere along the way get them invited into the system. So again, my question is, how do consumers want to be approached from your analysis and research? I think that's, again, part of the homework we really need to do and, and Jean's team is definitely looking into as we really roll out this initiative. Um, we have along the way of the many uh, savings tools and resources we've developed done various kinds of focus groups and you know one resounding thing we've heard as with all financial education is it really does start with knowing the people that you're trying to serve. What are the real challenges and obstacles they face you know, and taking those into realistic consideration, and what are some of the opportunities right there that you can work with? And that sort of breaks down into lots of different subgroups of people. So again, that work will be ongoing. One of the um, interesting things we found, uh, for example, in some of our previous uh, focus group work on savings is the the rule, idea of rules of thumb for saving that most Americans seem very familiar with this idea of save 10% of your income. And many, many people think that's completely unrealistic. And so when they hear that rule of thumb, instead of it being helpful, it is sometimes it's almost demoralizing, you know. And so those are the kinds of things we're trying to get a, a deeper understanding of and incorporate into our, our work. Well, one of the things I mentioned is that 
Um, when I taught at Texas Southern University several years ago, uh, one of the courses that was required in the business school was personal finance, and I taught personal finance. And, uh, and uh, there's a lot of benefit to uh, explaining to students the difference between assets um, that, are, that are worth investing in, uh, assets that earn for you, and, uh, and also the, the importance of utilizing um, credit in, in proper ways. Uh, many years later, as a president of the university, I realized right under my nose was really an important aspect that I missed when I was teaching in class. And that was that um, students, many students in, in the United States, uh, more than 40% of the students going to schools, uh, and, and for African Americans greater than that, don't complete. And then of the ones who do complete, time to completion is very, very long. And so as president, what we did was we focused on getting them to do four and no more, and also um, <clears throat> focused on completion. And that allowed us to move a uh, six-year graduation rate uh, from 38% to 45% in three years. Uh, and that makes an enormous impact on, on, these, on these young people who go to college because they come out with less debt and they are actually able to earn faster. So it is really important to look at all of these elements that uh, add up to the problems that the people have in terms of not being able to save. Jason. Thanks. Um, first, I similarly uh, would like to commend the Bureau for tackling this important topic um, I think that the example given regarding uh, rules of thumb for savings um, is really uh, illustrative of one of the problems that we're really struggling with, um, which is that uh, consumers' financial lives are complicated today, um, maybe more complicated than ever before. And it's really difficult to come up with simple one-size-fits-all guidance um, for how to manage, you know, your specific challenges, your specific financial goals, et cetera. Um, you know, and maybe it's the time of year, but I think a little bit about filing taxes. Um, you know, it's great to give people literature on how to do their taxes and a copy of the tax code, um, but it's better to give them uh, a copy of TurboTax. Um, to give them tools that are dynamic and that are tailored to their specific financial situation. Um, I think that, you know, what's always challenging with financial education is its effectiveness and relevance uh, to um, any, any potential audience. Um, so, you know, I think that the, uh, the upshot here is that um, there's really exciting development uh, ongoing right now in personal financial management software tools. Um, and, you know, we're seeing evidence that these tools work. Um, some of the strategies that Manning mentioned earlier, uh, automation, um, embedded, just-in-time personal financial um, uh, education, um, these strategies work, and consumers across the country are using them today um, to become more financially healthy. Um, but, you know, the development of these tools uh, really rests on um, a few foundational uh, 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 topics, one of which is the consumer's ability to access their own financial data and leverage that data um, in the way that they want. Um, so I would, you know, uh, encourage the Bureau, uh, when thinking about this topic, to spend some time um, learning about the developments uh, in uh, consumer uh, digital products in the space, um, the learnings from those products, um, and the innovation that's happening there, and also to think about the link between the consumer financial record and the consumer's ability to access that record and their ability to leverage these new tools. Sama. Building on kind of what Jason is saying, we do focus groups all the time to try to better understand why folks kind of fall behind on their debt and their obligations. And the one key theme you hear all the time is like, if one more person tells me that to skip that afternoon cup of coffee to put it towards savings or cut the cable bill, when in reality, 
Most people are trying to weigh in, do I take this extra shift versus the cost of childcare to do so? And, you know, again, based on what Jason's saying, there's this opportunity, though, the good news is to up-level the financial literacy for those personalized kind of needs, combine that with automation and the data to do so to actually help people manage those types of decisions. There's just a key up-level that has to happen versus, like, the basic literature or a belief of 80-20 that people are just kind of, like, spending kind of like money when it to them that comes off very pedantic and patronizing where they're actually trying to make difficult decisions. And I think a lot of great points have been brought up, which is having things go through my mind in terms of, um, and you have a question down here about how can you help amplify the message about the importance of establishing savings and a habit of savings. And something that keeps going through my mind, and both um, Sean and Brent, you touched on it, is partnering with others. As institutions, we're trying these programs and this and that, but it's how do we also engage the employers? And I know a lot of employers have um, financial wellness or wellness type committees, and it's encompassing financial wellness, and it's getting the message out there. And I, I feel, and, and it's not perfect, right? We can't reach every single person with these types of messages. I agree with what you said. But if it's a message coming from the employer, perhaps that helps, or that they have these rainy day programs, and you can start small. You can start with $5 or $10 and then build up. But I feel that if there's a way to somehow um, as I said, partner with various employers. I know there's, you know, an easier reach for the large employers because they employ lots of people, but I don't know, and I'm, I'm a little spouting, but I'm just thinking, like, through SBA or something to reach small businesses so we can cover more people, but I feel like if it's just coming from us, the message, it might not be resonating that, to your point, if I hear one more person say this, but if it's coming from the employer, maybe there's something else that can can stick and then a program could be in combination with a financial institution program or I mean any other type of program but to to get some traction with it but I'll, I will turn it back to you Brent uh, just two other points uh, there are some there's a lot of name issues just the way you know it would be nice to reform the names of savings accounts but there are several that have built-in motivations, and people will sacrifice, including grandparents and community members. So child savings accounts, ABLE accounts for the disabled, which are really emerging, like a 529 account, also 529 accounts, and a very big thing that causes people to come to even go to financial education, and that's saving for housing. So those are powerful motives, and a lot of it's doing for another. It's external. And lastly, I would mention a lot of state experiments on prize link savings. I know that was implied in your tax work and some of the, some of the literature you had. Uh, Commonwealth has done a lot of that work. So uh, we have sports betting now, so let's bet on savings. Yeah, I would just like to tag on um, to some of the comments <coughs> excuse me, Maureen made and how employers can help uh, their employees save. Um, and a lot of the, we talk about um, encouraging automatic savings in the background. And it's very difficult to do if um, individuals aren't utilizing a bank account or more importantly, or as importantly, a direct deposit. And so maybe um, providing some training resources for employers on how to encourage direct deposit in their employee base. We partner with some large employers in uh, the Lansing area or in Michigan um, that have large pay card programs because a lot of times there's some concern from the employees for whatever reason, that they either don't trust their bank or, or don't know how to access a bank account um, and then or may not want a direct deposit. And so encouraging that direct deposit so they can avail themselves of some of the te technologies and auto transfer and auto savings programs uh, I think would be important. And to follow up on that, you know, there a lot of employers will support 401k programs. And to, to your point, Brent, about 529 plans, you know, there's not a lot of focus on those. And we started a program just this year where I read something that said that someone who saves $1,000 for college is four or five times more likely for that child to go to college. Mm -hmm. So we started a program where we are investing for any of our employees who have a child under the age of 18. We give a certain amount per year into a 529 plan, which also hopefully is encouraging the parent to start promoting that. So I would think that there might be an opportunity to look at how do you promote instead of, not instead of, but in addition to 401k plans, programs to, for <laughs> employers to support those type of savings activities for the, for the children of their employer, of their employees. Um, and I would, I would just, um, another area where we can 
uh, focus our attention um, on um, the racial wealth gap is that the liquid asset poverty. And so in communities of color, there's not that generational wealth where you might have, uh, you know, someone's owned a home. And so to the extent that we can um, encourage um, communities who don't have ownership uh, to, to save to buy a home. Also, some emerging um, and exciting employee ownership business models, small businesses, where the employees not only earn a paycheck, but they get they earn ownership in a business um, or the building where the business operates can, again, give you that, you know, a lot of us, maybe we, we're not saving as much as we'd like to for our retirement because we're paying off our mortgage, but we know at the end of that, we've got this incredible asset. And, and that's certainly a, an area where there's a great deal of disparity that I think this work could kind of point people in that direction. Oh, and, and also, to your early point, um, George Watch helped, along with the Attorney General of Georgia, an app called Basic Training. It was, it's mainly focused for service members, but it ha it's a calculator tool on your phone's app. So if you're going to buy a car, you can look up and calculate, you know, how much is it going to how much is it going to cost me each month to pay for this car? We calculate the interest, and how long is it going to take me to save uh, to be able to actually buy that car? And a lot of other tools like that. But I, I agree with you. You got to have, you know, something that's in somebody's on somebody's smartphone that actually they can interact with and, and learn from. Um, Teresa Campbell, San Diego County Credit Union. I th think these are all really great ideas. The one thing I haven't quite heard is getting to the youth. And we do um, free biz kids in the San Diego Unified School District. I know other credit unions do that or buy to reality fairs where they teach youth about money management. But going back to Liz's comment, if there was a way for the Bureau to get that in schools nationwide across all communities, it might really have an impact on teaching kids. It's not going to be overnight, but at least it's a start and it would cut across socioeconomic divisions. Just to comment on that, I couldn't, I couldn't agree more. I sit on the board of a, a financial nonprofit um, education, financial beginnings in, in Washington, and we really, our studies have shown it, it's a drip campaign, and you start as early as kindergarten, and there's curriculum for the elementary, the middle school, and the high school, and if you can get them in that elementary school, um, and, and we partner to open youth accounts, you know, you bring the parents on board then at that point, and it's not seen as such a skip that cup of coffee it's seen as oh cool I get a piggy bank and I get to save and, and, and you know all of this sounds simple and it's a little of a lot or a lot of a little um, at the end of the day will we'll, we'll move us forward but I do think that this has to start in the school so if you can drive down the Department of Education and, and slam this onto their, their core math program or whatever it may be it has <coughs> to start in the schools because it's going to be a bottom up top down approach for success. Um, I think sort of a missed opportunity. We talk about the, the habit of savings and learning it, you know, from our parents sometimes, but in the absence of that, having it happen in school. But I think an opportunity that we have that credit unions have started going down, the um, member financial health initiatives are if a member comes in for a loan and they don't qualify for whatever reason, is not just delivering an adverse action to them, but also doing something proactive in terms of telling them where they can go from here. So the next time they apply for a loan, it could have a more positive outcome. A portion of that would be to um, establish a savings account and be able to put something away. Um, I think a lot of times people think of savings. I heard the quote here of a 10%. Um, and it sounds very daunting to be able to put away 10% 10, 10 of your salary if we reinforce that really when you say start small, you really me do mean small. Um, and we be mindful of when we're creating products not to initiate a minimum balance, um, in which case people start saving and you fee them out of, of that account. So I think that's also very important on the um, back end to be able to give them a solution if they don't qualify for a loan. Did you have something, Brian? Um, did you have something, Luz? Okay. Well, does anybody have anything? I was going to interject with a comment, but I didn't want to talk over anyone. Um, something that goes through my mind with this, too, is looking at some, you know, looking outside our financial services industry and how, how go back to the messaging, how are things communicated? And something that, and this is very important, and I think my analogy is also equally important, is just 
quick, clear messaging. So there's something that we have in our area. It's a, um, a chain of hospitals, and they have these billboards around that are talking about when do you go between urgent care and the ER, and they have, you know, the flu, urgent care, the plague, ER, and I, I feel like we could have some sort of messaging like that. I'm not quite sure what, because I don't want to have it, the, the, you know, we were talking about the, the cup of coffee or what have you, but I'm just thinking that a quick visual of this, not necessarily an emergency, this, an emergency, you know, the, the car breaks down or what have you, but the emergency side of it better, but I'm trying to think of that quick visual as far as, because I agree that when people hear 10% or when you you just talk about what an emergency is. I mean, we're in an emoji world. I just feel that that quick messaging can also send it, at least reinforce the message that we're not going to do everything by emoji, but I feel like that that supports the message. So that's something to consider. They've been, I, I think somebody else might have that type of messaging in their communities, but those billboards, I mean, they resonate with you as far as what's an emergency and what a health emergency and what's not. And I feel like we could take a lesson from that too. Go ahead. Yeah. So Maureen, I, I absolutely agree with you. I think people save for causes and if they could visualize and see those causes, I think that would work out great. We can't just say it's for a rainy day or an emergency fund. People don't save for that. But when you say save for a baby, save for a wedding, save for a car, or save for a house, they can visualize that kind of stuff. So even though we're starting small and saving for those type of pieces that they have to save for, you're absolutely right. I think if we put it on a billboard and say, this is the emergency, this is exactly what it looks like, people have that visual in their mind and then start saving for a, a specific type of cause. So I agree with you, absolutely. I, I won't take a, a, an official position on emojis, plus or minus, but, um, uh, but, but the, one, the one thing I would also encourage the Bureau to, to do is to look at analogous um, industries and those industries who have like, a, a, you know, demonstrated that they can drive progress and adherence, because it's really an adherence question. Um, so I would encourage you to look at the pharmaceutical industry. I would also encourage you to look at the uh, weight loss industry. Um, and you know techniques like Weight Watchers and things like that, which just give people measurable sense of progress, community, all of these types of things that are really about building confidence. Uh, I, I think you'll I think you'll be inspired by by some of those uh, success stories. I think that was one of the things I wanted to comment on when I read through your material about the the tax planning that, uh, to try and get them to do that. It looked like the rewards that were built around that, and I know it was limited information, but it looked like it was almost an immediate, again, put your tax savings away and you're in a, a pool to, to win something or to, to... And I would rather encourage you to make it be a longer-term plan. So if they put it in there, that's great, but they maybe it needs to be there for six months or for a year before they're eligible and uh, to to get that so it it encourages a the habit but it also encourages them to keep it there uh, as long as they can this may sound silly but we have no spokesperson if you think about the things in the world that sell whether it's phones whether it's uh, sports athletic equipment all of that uh, those sell. We don't have anyone speaking on our behalf as far as providers. My point being, if we had a celebrity that would speak to this issue, I'm, I'm dead serious about this, to start conversations in families. That's what you need. You got to start with a conversation between a husband and wife about, you know, Oprah's right or Michelle Obama's right or you name anyone. I don't care. We've got a problem in our family. Let's talk about it, you know? And it could be just about anyone that has a high profile to be willing to donate their time to start a conversation in a community to generate some excitement. Because let's face it, I sit here and listen to all this. Sounds really great. I mean, I've got kids. One is a tremendous saver. In fact, he saves too much money. I have another daughter, not so much. So, but I try to start conversations in their families with their spouses about what are you doing in savings? I'm not, I don't pry necessarily, but let's talk about it as a family. How do you, how do you get the ball rolling and, and start that drip of savings, as you say, to generate something? So right now, all of this conversation is terrific material. We do terrific things in our organization as well, but to be incredibly impactful I think you need someone of note to begin the conversation. That's my two cents. 
Thank you. And unfortunately, we're out of time. Um, we need to move on to the next conversation. But I think we've had a lot of great things to discuss. So thank you for your time. Our next discussion. Our next discussion is focused on the Bureau's recently released advance notice of proposed rulemaking on property assessed clean energy or PACE financing. I'll give a moment for our next speakers to join us. So I'm pleased to welcome the following Bureau subject matter experts for this discussion. We have Mark McArdle, Assistant Director for the Bureau's Office of Mortgage Markets, and Joel Singerman, Counsel in the Office of Regulations. And thank you both for joining us. We'll give you a minute to get settled for, you can start with your remarks. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you for uh, staying awake this long. Uh, today we're talking about the property assessed clean energy. Uh, let me uh, click the thing. As most of you know, Congress passed legislation last year mandating that we prescribe certain rules governing PACE financing. On March 4th of this year, we issued a call for public information and advance notice of, of public rulemaking, a proposed rulemaking, which is the first step in the rulemaking process. And today we're going to provide a general overview of the project and take some questions. Property assessed clean energy financing means financing to cover the costs of home improvements that results in a tax assessment on the real property of the consumer. And that's how the legislation is, defines PACE. And we states authorize a form of financing commonly referred to as PACE that covers specific project types, usually energy efficient type projects, solar panels, water conservation, and the like. Some background stats, about 20 states have a enabling legislation that allows PACE type financing to occur, but residential, residential property. There's also commercial PACE, which we are not focused on or we'll talk about today. Residential PACE is tw in 20 states. Uh, only three states have active programs, California, Florida, and Missouri. And California, by far, is the largest of those. Uh, PACE Nation, which is a trade group, reports that uh, there's over 200,000 PACE assessments, totaling $5 billion. So that's relatively small on the scale of the mortgage market. But uh, they have uh, they reached a peak around 2016, but they've been declining in the last few quarters, at least in California, which is the biggest state. We understand in some PACE programs, various actors are involved. That includes state and local governments, private companies who administer certain aspects of the programs. Generally, consumers remit payments to the local taxing authority, but uh, it's the private companies, the administrators, that really drive the marketing and originations of the program. And I'm going to turn it over to Joel to talk a little bit about what the, the law requires. Thank you, Mark. Oops, excuse me. Can everybody hear me okay? Okay, great. So... Uh, right. So the Economic Growth Regulatory Relief and Consumer Protection Act that Mark referred to is the, the uh, statute that Congress passed in 2018 requiring, requiring us to do a rulemaking on PACE. Um, this, is this not working? Work for me. Oh, there you go. I was pressing the wrong button. <laughs> Um, so this is the language in the statute uh, requiring the rulemaking. It reads, the Bureau shall prescribe regulations that carry out the purposes of subsection A and apply, sub and apply section 130 with respect to violations under subsection A of this section with respect to property assessed clean energy financing, which shall account for the unique nature of property assessed clean energy financing. So this is under the Truth in Lending Act. There are essentially three elements uh, of this provision as it relates to our rulemaking. The first is that it requires an ability to repay rule um, with respect to PACE financing. Uh, for those of you new to, new to this space, the TILA currently provides um, uh, an ability to, to, to repay uh, requirement with respect to residential mortgage loans. In brief, that means that creditors are prohibited from originating residential mortgage loans unless they have first made a reasonable determination of the consumer's quote unquote ability to repay the loan uh, uh, based on its terms. And in making that determination, the creditor is required to look at, at you know, the consumer's income, debt obligations, assets, and the like. Um, 
The second element of the statutory requirement for the PACE rulemaking is that we must apply Section 130 of TILA, which, uh, you know, there, there's a lot in there. In general, it, it sets forth TILA's civil liability provision, uh, includes, you know, it provides for actual damages, statutory damages, uh, and a foreclosure defense specifically applicable to the ability to repay rules currently, again, in place for residential mortgage loans. Um, and then last, the third element in the statute is that all of the all of the regulations that we are required to write for for pace uh, must quote unquote account for the unique nat excuse me account for the unique nature of of pace. This is obviously going to be a key element of our rulemaking, um, as Mark mentioned, and and we'll get into in a bit in a bit more detail just in uh, a moment. We recently issued an ANPR to collect information on pace financing. You know, this is this is uh, a central reason for that. We really want to understand you know, the loan product in the market in order to tailor the existing regulations uh, uh, to account for the unique nature of PACE. Um, okay, so as to the ANPR, um, we, you know, so we, we want to emphasize before we tick through what is in the ANPR that we are, you know, deeply in information gathering mode at this point. You know, we have what we think is a good understanding of the market. We want, a, you know, a, uh, a much better understanding of the market. Engaging with folks like yourselves uh, and other stakeholders and listening is going to be really critical as we move through the process. So we really appreciate your time now and encourage you to respond to the ANPR. Um, the, as you can see on the screen, um, uh, the, the ANPR is broken into to around five different general sections of questions. The first, you know, is a general solicitation for written materials provided to consumers as part of the transaction. That includes the contract, uh, maybe the home improvement contract, to the extent that those are separate from the financing contract, any disclosures and the like. Uh, the second general category of questions we pose really asks questions to understand what's happening on the ground during the originations, right? So, you know, who collects the application? What does the application uh, consist of? Who, who, who um, conducts the underwriting analysis? You know, is there any ATR uh, um, uh, determination currently made in underwriting, et cetera? Uh, the third category of questions asks, you know, a few questions to help us under better understand how we might apply the civil liability provisions in TILA. Um, the fourth category of questions asks a whole bunch of questions about, about, about how uh, um, PACE is unique, and how, uh, including you know, um, how the financing is structured, how it integrates with the local property tax system. We understand that public bonds are involved sometimes in some programs, so exactly how, how that implicates PACE. Um, and then last, we ask a series of questions um, that are specific to TILA and specific to Regulation Z, asking for stakeholders' views on, you know, which aspects of TILA would make sense for PACE, how we might tailor the existing rules, if that's the approach that we ultimately take in the proposal uh, to account for the unique na nature of PACE financing, uh, etc. cetera. Um, oh, I wanted to mention two quick things for those of you who are planning on responding to the ANPR. Uh, the first is that we, you know, to the extent that we didn't ask a question um, and you think that you have information that's valuable to us, we would love to receive that information. Please don't, you know, consider it an exclusive set of questions. Um, and second, um, you know what, I'll leave it at, at the first point. Uh, he can't read his writing. <laughs> that's true. Um, so the, the comment period just opened. It's going to last until May 7th is when public, the public comment period ends on the ANPR. And I think that's all I have to say. I'll pass it back to Mark. The next, the next phase in the rulemaking is uh, we will be uh, developing an NPRM, or Notice of Proposed Rulemaking. We're going to, of course, consider all the feedback we got to the ANPR, and we'll be engaging directly with stakeholders like yourself to understand your views and collect information useful to the rulemaking. In this case, we'll be coordinating a lot with state and local governments who are key players. California has already issued several rules around ATR uh, for that state, and we have we've been in contact with the Department of Business Oversight, and we plan to continue to do so. Uh, we view input from you all as critical to achieving our goals here, not just because the statute requires us to consult about the unique nature, but because PACE is a fairly complex financial instrument that differs from state to state. 
So getting feedback from folks on the ground will be critical for us understanding what's going on and developing the most effective rules that we can. And eventually, did it click? Mm -hmm. Yeah, eventually after the issuing the uh, MPRM, collecting comments on the proposal from members of the public and reviewing those comments, we'll see where it makes sense to amend the proposal and we'll develop the final rule. Usually, you know, 60 days after that is the common thing. Again, we continue to expect to engage with folks like yourself and stakeholders across the country as we do this. So uh, that's generally it, but we'd love to hear from you and any feedback you have. Thank you for that. Um, being from Florida and one of the active mm -hmm. players in this, I have to admit I didn't have experience with it, so I've been reading a lot over the past week or so about it. And um, I wanted to see if before we delve into the questions, though, could we look back at the history of the program? Because when this first came out and I was reading the materials, my ability to repay, of course, why not? You know, that makes sense. And then as I went back to issuances that came out in 2009 and 10, and then again in 2016, when I looked back at the first um, policy framework, it was I thought it was clear in the messaging on how these programs were supposed to work that there was no ability to repay concept because it was built on an assessment that the, whatever improvement is being done, that borrower would be saving more as the, the implementing whatever it is, solar panels or what have you, they would save more in utilities than what that extra assessment would be. So they had it, it was a, a concept of um, pay for itself. And it seems that when I read the guidance from 2009 to 2010, they still talk about the, the concept of it needs to pay for itself. And there needs to be some sort of benefit in order to do this. And then when I get into the 2016 guidance, it, it talks more about it introduces the concept of ability to repay. But here we are on this official ability to repay, but I feel like and, and maybe that was just the natural progression of this, that it's, it's changed, but it seemed that the initial intent was there would be some sort of assessment to say there is enough savings here that it makes sense to go through with whatever this improvement is. And if it, if it has evolved, that's fine. But I also look at the, the duration of some of these. Like I looked through the Florida program mm -hmm. and the duration of it made sense when you're saying, okay, well, every month, you know, they're going to have a $400 savings in their utility bill, and it's going to be an extra $300 as far as the tax assessment. So each month they're saving $100. That makes perfect sense and why it would be maybe over five or 10 years. But it seems where we are right now is the assessment period hasn't changed. So they're like, so, and don't hold me to these examples, but the solar panels are um, worthy, they have a life of 15 years. So we're gonna have this assessment over 15 years, which starts then to me question, well, if there's no longer an assessment on if there's savings, does it make sense to amortize this over 15 years? I mean, my analogy for that is a, a car. My car might have a useful life of 10 or 15 years, but most car loans are not 10 or 15 years. So I don't know if you could talk to the, the history and the evolution of the program, because I think that helps figure out how we got to where we are today. And I know that was a loaded question. <laughs> <laughs> um, right. So I guess at the outset, I would make a couple of, of points. First, you know, these are state programs authorized under state law. So you know, we want to be careful not to characterize the programs or characterize the history of a program you know, um, relatedly. Uh, you know, there are multiple programs within each state that m may, might be different, right? And so um, I think it's difficult to overgeneralize here, or, you know, we run the risk of overgeneralizing if we provide sort of a uniform history. Um, uh, so my understanding is, is that, is that um, California in particular has been more active in recent years in, in legislating uh, consumer protections, including what they call an ability to pay requirement. I think that, as Mark mentioned, the Department of Business Oversight is currently, as we understand it through the grapevine, in the process of, you know, developing regulations to implement those standards. Um, to my knowledge, again, these are state programs, maybe, maybe there's, you know, there are statutes or rules out there that, you know, we're not aware of, but to my knowledge, uh, you know, those, those would be the first uh, uh, legally required statutorily required uh, um, uh, requirements that look like an ATR rule or an ability to pay rule. Uh, 
uh, I understand that that you know s state statutes appear to have had you know other underwriting guidelines in place from the outset, um, but you know the the recent California legislation uh, really you know provided a bit more teeth from from what it appears um, as to you know which you know, what consumers are told, you know, during the marketing process. We've heard anecdotes mm -hmm. that suggest that, that consumers, you know, some consumers sometimes are, you know, provided misleading information. At this stage, those are complete, you know, we, we, we perceive those as, as anecdotal stories, uh, you know, um, not sure, you know, the veracity or, or, um, or the, the pervasiveness of, of, of any consumer experiences to that end. Not that, that not that that's not you know critical information for us, but um, but uh, you know it is what it is. Um, uh, and I think to, to that same end, you know, how many consumers are saving money versus how many consumers you know each pay period are you know required to pay more out of pocket than they're receiving on energy savings. I, d I don't think that we have that information at this point. Right. And there, there is, you know, some concern, especially several federal agencies, including FHFA and FHA, prohibit PACE financing from being put on top of their lead because they're concerned of what happens to lien priority in particular. And there are stories of folks who got in trouble in their property taxes from this. So it, it is something that we have to balance both sides of that. I'll be quiet in a minute, but um, <laughs> just in my reading, too, I, I read, and what I was reading came from the White House in 2009, mm -hmm. and I understand each state has their own program, but it was very much targeted at the, it, it has to do with the cost of improvements to the property, not the individual, and so that's where I feel like there's been a shift with it, that all along the intention was it is with the property, and it's because you're having those savings on the, the your property, your utility bills associated with your property, and that seemed to, to really drive the program. And I understand that things might have changed today, but I, but I go, and my leap from it, though, is if that's the initial intent, even though each state adopted a different program and maybe multiple programs um, within a state, it seems that that was the premise of it. That was kind of the foundation of it. So then I look at it that if we are moving away from that, and I, I applaud the ability to repay, but then I think of we might want to look at those useful lives or, or the, the period in which they're paying those assessments because they're paying it far longer than they would pay a comparable loan at a financial institution. And with that, I will turn it over to Liz. Sorry, no, I look like I'm chopping at the bit, but I am because I have a lot to say on PACE, but I'll, I promise to stay relevant. Um, so Georgia is one of the 20 states um, that authorized PACE uh, about 10 or so years ago. Um, and only recently have things started happening. Um, in part, um, and you know, Maureen, you're correct that this, uh, the, I think the intention uh, to create opportunities for those who can't afford the upfront cost of energy efficiency improvements, this is a great way, uh, particularly in the commercial pace space. So the city of Atlanta, uh, a couple years ago, adopted a 100% clean energy goal and also a, a very aggressive and, and wonderfully positive building efficiency goal. Mm -hmm. And um, so the uh, Atlanta uh, Development Authority, known as Invest Atlanta, uh, has been moving forward with actually um, city legislation to enable PACE financing to move forward in the commercial space. Again, we don't have a problem with that. Um, unfortunately, the um, and you mentioned it's the private companies that drive this, mm -hmm. and the private company that's driving this has figured out that the bond issuance for PACE finance, for commercial PACE, isn't going to make them enough money. So they're trying to force through residential PACE. We're working very hard to get protections like those that were adopted in California because we know that people have lost their homes. Uh, because there are both good actors, and in every other market, we know there are bad actors and scammers. And we have a very aggressive county property tax collector where Atlanta sits. And we also have on the books in Georgia the ability for super lien. So if you have an unpaid dental bill, it can be bundled, and you can lose even your, you can be out of your home in 30 to 90 days. So I'm, so yes, so this is an urgent, so I'm so pleased that you're moving forward with this because we are in the state of urgency. We're told by the private company and their consultant uh, that they don't, they, they are concerned that if they apply the consumer protections in Georgia that were applied in California, they'll see what happened in California. In California, their pace of residential pace 
has declined significantly because they're no longer able to make loans to low-income vulnerable people who are the ones most at risk of losing their homes. So there's that, there's that going on. I want to, and also, Maureen, I'm talking a little bit, of, uh, there's a difference between pace and pays, and I want to pay as you save, which is a much better way to achieve what we're talking about. No, so it got even worse earlier this week. Uh, the Georgia Senate, we're in the midst of our legislative session. And, as a, and I, I absolutely understand the intent of um, uh, the senators um, who are sponsoring this legislation. Um, we had a hurricane, as most of you know, that devastated South Georgia. Uh, and it's going to be a long time to recover, and they're trying to find a lifeline to that. Also, we have rural Georgians that still don't have access to broadband. The state is finally doing some innovative things to bring broadband to rural Georgia. So they've just it crossed the, over the Senate, it's in the House, to add to the pace and acting legislation, in addition to financing energy efficiency, you can finance disaster recovery and installing broadband. Hmm and it's on the property tax bill. And they simply don't understand that this has a priority lien. Um, and at this point, it has the potential for the kind of abuse we already have. You all know when there's a disaster, horrible people go in door to door, you know, scam contractors. And they convince people that they can repair the home and they take the money. Imagine that scam contractor with PACE financing at their disposal. Um, and so people are not only not able to repair their homes, but they're going to lose their homes. So it really is a, a, a matter of urgency for us. I want to, before I move on, I want to um, uh, quickly address um, what, um, uh, there's something called pay as you save. It's very confusing because there's PACE, Property Assessed Clean Energy. But pay as you save, which is typically offered by uh, electric member co-ops, uh, but can be offered by, we've got a municipal utility, and now our investor-owned utility, Georgia Power, is piloting. Pay as you save just does exactly what Maureen was talking about. It is um, a, 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 a licensed, uh, approved by the state contractor, uh, comes to the home and does an energy efficiency assessment, which is not done with PACE. Mm -hmm. With PAYS, they do the energy efficiency, and, and PAYS is trademark. There are other, it's, it's, it's a tariffed, on bill finance for utilities. So the, the utility or, and or sends in the contractor who does an, a home energy audit and determines specific measures that would improve the efficiency of the home and most important, lower power bills. That is then applied to the power bill, but it is structured with an 80-20 so that the consumer is guaranteed to keep at least 20% of the savings that the, ex, the, the, the auditors have, can calculate very specifically, putting this amount of insulation in, putting you know, various measures, this is gonna reduce your monthly power bill by this month, this much, and they can be that exact. Hmm. Then 80% of that savings goes to paying it back, and 20% goes to the, the homeowner saving that money. Then, then um, the homeowner is unlike with PACE where if you want to sell your house and you've got PACE, you've got to pay off the loan. That's not the case. This stays with the property. The, the pay as you stay, save or on bill tariff finance stays with the property. I only recently learned about another opportunity for consumers who want to do the good thing, which is lower their power bills. It's called sealed, S-E-A-L-E-D, sealed.com. You know about it. It's only in New York now, but it's going to some other states. It is, they're calling it a synthetic tariff-based financing. It's a third-party financing. And the ways they can do it, um, some, uh, Georgia Power has a, um, an online marketplace and you can go on, on there and you can shop for an energy efficiency HVAC or LED light bulbs or other products to make your home more energy efficient. Sealed can actually contract with the provider of that online marketplace for energy efficiency to offer the homeowner that same you know, situation where you, you are able to go in and identify what measures you need and pay for them over time. And, and with sealed, it's you're paying sealed. So I need to find, I don't, I'm not, this is not an endorsement, not an endorsement, just learning, but that there is this a struct where there are guaranteed savings and the amount the homeowner pays is a, a, a smaller portion than the actual savings so that they get to keep some of that money. So PACE is a disaster and anyway, I mean, I know you're talking about anecdotes, but I know of real people who, who have had this experience. And we, we, it's just, it, you know, commercial pace, fine, but I guess. But residential pace, if, if they don't want 
to offer it in a state that has ability to repay, that means they want to be able to approach vulnerable people who are most at risk from this um, pace. And that, I'll stop now. Sorry. <laughs> That's that's uh, uh, really helpful. I really appreciate that. I have a, a comment and then a question. First, th th you know, that type of information is exactly the type of information that we didn't ask about in the ANPR that we would love you to provide, you know, okay. other you other I've programs that, that, that <laughs> Okay, great. Other programs that, you know, at the state level that, uh, that um, would provide the same types of, of financing, you know, and along with an explanation of, you know, additional protections in those programs that consumers may or may not have with, with PACE financing, uh, et cetera. Um, I had a question. Um, the, so you, you mentioned in particular with, with the PAYS program, mm -hmm. P-A-Y-S, mm -hmm. that the financing stays with the property. Mm -hmm. So in the states that I'm aware of, that's, that's, that's how PACE is structured as well. Mm. Um, again, anecdotally, we've heard that some consumers, you know, even though technically the, the assessment would stay with the property if the consumer sells the house, they, you know, the new buyer might not want to right. purchase it, and so some right. consumers are required to pay it off in the transaction. Right. How large are the pay, P A Y S um, uh, financing obligations, um, such that the, the buyers in those transactions, um, where P A Y S encumbers the property, aren't requiring the seller to, to pay off off uh, the the. Um, the, I, I, and I'm not sure that this would be the case. W again, it's emerging with um, municipal and investor-owned utilities. But with electric member co-ops, I think it's the nature of the co-op structure. So an excellent example is um, Washita, which is spelled O-I-C-H-I-T-A. Uh, Arkansas uh, is the EMC that has one of the, the um, best models for how it's designed. And it's structured because it's a member co-op that it's staying within the, I guess, the, the membership of, the, you know, the members own the utility, the EMC. And it's, uh, so I'm not, and the payback is just based on what the measures are that are installed, as I understand them. It's not, we're not talking 20 years or 15 years, you know, it's a much, it's a much shorter time. But again, the, the, the person who is purchasing the home is going to experience a lower utility cost than they would have. So the benefits are baked into it. And so there don't seem to be issues with people not, it's, it's not taking on the same kind of obligation you might take on with a PACE loan. Okay, thank you. I don't know how I follow Liz's passion, but... And I'll it's not on their property taxes. <laughs> it's not on their property taxes. No, it's right. not. No, no, it's on their, it's on their utility bill. It's not on their property taxes. It's on their utility bill. Yeah. So I was fortunate um, earlier this week to sit in on a panel discussion with Joel and some of the other members of the Bureau at um, our recent conference, and I appreciate the opportunity to chat with you again. Um, and I'm going to reference, uh, for those of you who weren't there, so there was a gentleman from California who stood up and talked about that he had received a cold call about a PACE loan. He was told three different times that it was a government-guaranteed program. He, he was smart enough to ask questions, you know, sort of to lead the, the cold caller on to say, you know, my wife spends a lot of money, our credit cards are all maxed out. The answer was, don't worry about it, we'll take care of all that. You never have to worry about the financing, it's all going to be handled. Um, you know, obviously a, a very, you know, deceptive sales pitch to try to take advantage of, you know, that individual to try and get him into this program. And the questions that I asked in our conversation the other day, started off around just sort of, I, I am very troubled by the idea that these are, although they are by definition property assessed loans, as to why that is endemic into the structure of these loans and how that is potentially disastrously harmful for the consumers. As, as you described, it is a state issue that, that the Bureau doesn't have any uh, purview over, the same way as, Mark, as you described, the super priority lien issue that Federal Housing Finance Authority has has indicated that they will not buy loans that have PACE loans on them. It becomes a problem for refinance. It becomes a problem um, when you're selling. Um, when we talked about it, you know, again, given that there's only a handful of states that have um, regulations in place or even contemplated, I, I encourage the Bureau to, even though it's outside of your purview, to look at those issues as you prepare the final rule given that many states will look to the Bureau's guidance as they're crafting those type of rules. And I, I think that it is, you know, as Liz says, you know, PACE has the potential to be a disaster for consumers given what they're not being told. Um, beyond that, 
whether it's Maureen's version of, you know, pay as you go, apparently there is no calculation that says that if it's going to cost you $300 a month, you're going to save $400 a month. It's assumed, but it's not baked into the analysis that's done mm -hmm. to qualify for that loan. There is no ability to repay. The debt to, ratio, debt to income ratio, the loan to value calculations, there's no truth in lending disclosures that are required. These are not lenders. They're not licensed. They're not regulated. So whatever you come up with needs to be you know, very robust in order to protect the consumers from a disclosure to make sure they understand that it is not a government sponsored, that even though it is through the property tax, it is a private loan that is going to be assessed. Um, the penalties for not paying you know, up to foreclosure you know, I was told by someone the other day that the, the penalties for late payments on these loans through the taxes can be up to, you know, 12 to 18 percent, which is, you know, an outrageous amount to pay. Um, so there's there's a lot of room. But again, my number one concerns are the, the property assessed aspect, which I, I understand is not in your purview to change, and the super priority lien. And I encourage that discussions with, with FHFA go ongoing as to how, how that can be remedied or how it can be mitigated. That's great. Do you mind? No, um, uh, really appreciate that. For the sake of objectivity, I do want to point out, as Mark mentioned, our understanding is that a lot of this lending so far on the residential side has occurred in California. Um, and, they, and the state legislator has been quite active in the consumer protection space. Five so, separate bills, I think. <laughs> <laughs> right. Five, Mark says five separate bills in recent years, to our knowledge. Um, uh, so they have, you know, begun implementing what, what appear to be um, um, really important consumer protections, including financial disclosures, mm -hmm. you know, and an ability to pay rule and just on down the line. So I, I, I want to, you know, some, I just want to be um, clear, right? Some of, the, some of the concerns that you cited, you know, are in the process, at least in California, of, it appears, of, of um, having something on the books, right? Uh, um, Brian Bruns from Minnesota, and we just last year in our state associations worked with our state legislature to work on PACE, and one of the things that we were just really key on is that we did not want the PACE loans to take a first lien priority. Mm -hmm. And so we were successful in convincing the legislators to not give that first lien priority. Mm -hmm. And so it does go on the taxes, and I understand that the devil's in the details, I know, but our state is one that is not doesn't allow the priority position. And so my understanding is that PACE has now picked up and moved on to other states. And so for me, all of these programs, um, I do think that from what I can hear you guys talking about, you want to pr protect the consumer from the ability to repay. And we're all for that. But the fundamental issue is if they get a first lien priority, they may or may not stick around and, and um, adhere to some of that. If they don't get the first lien priority, they're out is what we're mm -hmm. seeing. And so I don't know if, if you can do that from a nationwide perspective, because I think that is what really does hurt the consumer in the end indirectly. If we as mortgage providers can somehow in two, three, five, ten, fifteen 10, 15 years down the road have somebody walk in and get ahead of our position, that is ultimately going to affect how we have to price mortgages, which is going to affect all consumers. So I don't know, again, if it is, I know you're talking about it being a state issue, but I would encourage you to look at what we did in Minnesota and, and see if that's something that can be done nationwide. Thank you. I'll definitely take a look. Uh, just got a few financial education odd points, and this may be a, something the Bureau does, questions to ask before considering a PACE loan, but these are, it's a, it's a grab bag. Why heap? connection issue that could motivate people to go there. There might be some public assistance to go into that. Mitigation issues if somebody's in a flood zone or, you know, people start to reassess the quality of their home It may look for savings, but what if FEMA wants to relocate the home <laughs> at some point? I mean, you know, you could really get caught. Home warranty interaction, HOA rules, uh, length of time somebody's going to spend in the home, and reverse mortgage issues. Thank you. Just to um, go along with what Brian was saying, I, you know, I see this. I didn't have um, really any inter interaction with this before the NPR, so I was, like Maureen, kind of reading on it. And um, I see the potential risk of harm to the customer or the borrower in this sense is that, you know, if it's a super lien, they may not have the ability to finance their home. 
um, you know, in, in my bank, we sell our loans. And if a secondary market will not purchase those loans, we may not be able to make a 30-year loan. Um, in many cases, we can portfolio and do a lesser term. But in a lot of cases, people are looking for a 30-year mortgage. And in that case, you know, if a secondary market would not purchase it, it really inhibits the customer to be able to, to finance or refinance their home. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll build on that a little bit. Uh, uh, we have Pace in Texas. It seemed to have a lot more buzz a couple of years ago. Um, we we don't portfolio consumer residential mortgages, but we in Texas we have a fairly robust and, and maybe what some might say aggressive uh, property tax lien lenders uh, because they know that they can get it at five ten percent LTV with uh, very uh, uh, favorable rates uh, for for the lender. Um, and, and so for, for our bank, it's an event of default if you get financing that primes are first. Mm -hmm. So uh, as far as like commercial, I guess that would be since we're not portfolio and consumer, it would be an immediate event of default for them to go get this type of financing. And do they generally enforce the default if they were, for, were, for instance, to, to take a first lien pace? So, so for us, if, if we, we monitor to see if some, so we haven't had experience with a pace loan, but for property tax liens, uh, the, the legislature recently passed uh, some some uh, uh, laws where we get notif notification now, and so when we see that, we immediately contact the borrower and, and instruct them that you know you are now in default and you know progress down that path. Right. In some states, they're not even notified the lender isn't if that, the that, yeah. It, so. it used to be like that in Texas, yeah. which was a, a real issue. And th these are property tax loans, is that right? Property tax loans, but the okay. pace follows a similar path. Yeah. got a couple more comments if uh, if I may so obviously the uh, ability to repay is an important um, area to look at, at rulemaking um, uh, obviously teal you're, you're gonna, so there's going to be some additional disclosure requirements um, we want to make sure that um, you know there's sufficient advanced um, not only advanced disclosure but very important we understand that some of these contractors are you know going door to door with the with their, you know, laptops, okay. and they're so showing, you know, here, look on my screen, and then sign here, and it's done. So we want to make sure that there's protections against um, electronic disclosures that kind of force the mm -hmm. consumer to um, not really fully understand what they're agreeing to. So um, we also want to make sure, in light of that, that there's also at least a three-day uh, right to cancel. Um, and and we think it's important, you know, as with with you know with a mortgage, you know, there need to be some long-term. You know, there need to be monthly statements. You know, when when someone suddenly finds out at the end of the bill, at the end of the year, on their property tax bill, it's it's up significantly more because they they don't have an escrow and they're not paying on a monthly basis. So we want want to make sure about that. Um, also, we want to make sure as um, um, that um, um, the valuation of properties is independent. Um, again, clarifying the status of the lien. It really. It, should not be priority lien, so that's all important conversation. Um, there should include um, uh, hardship protections, uh, provisions ensuring borrowers will have access to the loss mitigation procedures um, to avoid a tax lien foreclosure and other, you know, um, 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 remedies available to homeowners um, in the um, in the mortgage space. Thank you. I have a question following up on, on Eric's comment, and I think I already know the answer, but I'll ask it anyway. Um, back to the super priority lien. In Nevada, we, we have a super priority lien issue with homeowners associations that has been, um, at least in the state, quite a contentious issue and some very large um, lawsuits. So is it possible in the scope of the, the final rule to have a notification provision such that if the super priority lien is taking action, that the first mortgage holder can or should or must be notified in order to um, at least attempt to protect that, or is that strictly a state issue? Director Kreininger. So I think it's it's um, it would be premature for us to comment, you know, at this point on on what a final rule would look like, let alone a proposed rule. At this phase, we're really just focused on gathering information. But again, if you have you know particular views. We are all ears, and we mean it. Well, because that would certainly go a long way from, from a lender perspective for mitigating. And again, back to our HOA issue, the state legislature in the last session did pass a law that required notification right. because the big issue that came up was there was a, a million-dollar property loan that was foreclosed on for a $6,000 
uh, delinquent assessment on an HOA, and the state Supreme Court ruled that it was a valid foreclosure. Um, so the notification clause would go a long way from a lender perspective to mitigating the risk um, of, you know, untoward action down the line. And I think Florida does require notification, at least one that it's paid, placed for the lender to be notified. Right? Yeah. So, so um, you know, with that, with the, the caveat, with my earlier caveat that it's far too early for us to prognosticate about what a proposal might include, I will, you know, draw you back to the statute that we're working under, right? I mean, the statute specifically directs, you know, an ATR rule, right? That, that uh, um, that provision of TILA is specifically called out in the statute, and it specifically, you know, uh, requires a rule on PACE financing. So, you know, th that's the those are some of the constraints we're operating under, as opposed to necessarily, you know, the the HOA first lien issue. So, my understanding is that um, the city council must agree to PACE financing through a joint powers authority, and so they're allowing their tax levying authority to be used, right, mm -hmm. for, um, you know, for, for this purpose without having really any oversight. So is there an opportunity here to educate city council members? Because what they're being told is, oh, this is just an additional form of financing for local residents to be able to improve their houses. Is there an opportunity here to educate city council members on what this really does. I mean, that's something we can take back the consumer. I mean, we do plan to work closely with state and local governments as we, we roll this out so we can see what would be useful from an information point of view. Go ahead. Um, one of the things that I know the Bureau did when it was in, in its inception was to try and level the playing field mm -hmm. for um, all areas, and I, when you go look at the registry, you know the credit unions, the banks, were all you know how many there are, mm -hmm. you, and we have um, scheduled exams that we have to go through. So, can you does the bureau know how many pace vendors there are? Is there a registry? Is there something that um, you know? I, I it seems like in our field, we're regulated on a proactive basis and on the non-financial institutions it becomes more of a complaint driven uh, and I'm wondering if that can start to be shifted where you would get have to be registered to be doing PACE programs or other programs like this so that you could go out on a more proactive basis and look at things. Right. I mean, they are registered at the local level, but I don't know of any national registry because it is state by state, local by local, but uh, that's something we can look at too. But. Yeah. Our understanding is that at this point it continues to be a fairly fairly confined universe. Um, like a handful of firms we understand are, are of, of any size. But your point about data is interesting. It is hard to get uniform data across. There's some you because there it's it's an assessment on your property taxes, and so people like there's companies like CoreLogic that have some of this data, but there's it's very hard to get centralized data, you know, across on how many pace loans there are. But but I guess I would argue that the the fundamental. Um, program itself is kind of flawed if the, the only way we go in and regulate these people is based on complaint. Nobody's going to complain that they got the new furnace or they got the new solar panels until down the road when it happens mm -hmm. and it's already, the cat's already the, out of the bag by then. So I, I just think that having some type of a um, pre-exam, pre-look at their business plan, what they're doing mm -hmm. is really, that is in the spirit of leveling the playing field. I just wanted to go back. One of the questions here for us is how might the Bureau consider educating consumers about PACE financing? And I want to echo, because obviously there's a need for that, but um, in my research, I came across what Luz was talking about, that uh, at least in Florida, as I can see, and again, I don't hold myself out as an expert, but from everything I was researching, it seems that there's more of a hands-off, if you will, a approach or take on the municipalities as far as what's happening in the tax assessment. So I would encourage the Bureau that there's educating the consumers, but there's also educating you know, the, the local governments mm -hmm. as far as what is happening to the people within your communities and make sure they really do understand it and that they could be a resource to and somebody that they could reach out to instead of like, I don't know that, you know, that was a separate program because they really are attached to it. 
Um, so that was a thought that I had there. And I, I know you said that there's multiple programs in Florida, but Liz had touched on something as far as um, the, the consumer's knowledge about this. And at least a program that I saw in Florida, they do have something very truth and lending oriented. It's not the truth and lending disclosure, but it does have the APR, it has the, the repayment terms, they have a rescission period. They go so far as to have a phone call it says it may be recorded. It doesn't have to be recorded, but they need to document that they made the phone call. So all of those things I think are great, but my concern is, and it was um, mentioned earlier too, is how do we measure that that's happening effectively where they're not just, oh, here, sign here, oh, we're, you know, they're calling me, yes, we're going to put in your solar panels tomorrow, great, and how do we know that, you know, there's all these protections that seem to be built into it, but how do we know that they're going to be working? I, I think that one county you were talking about it in Florida, it's St. Lucie County, we talked to the administrator. So they, that was a county level disclosure that they implemented on their own. And so it's not universal across counties in Florida, but uh, they require a call. They, it's the county folks who are actually doing that, not even the, 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 they issue the disclosure and they make sure everyone knows that this assessment is being placed on the property. So that could be a prototype for but it's, other yeah, it's, counties? It's okay. the only county I know of in Florida that does that. Okay. Maureen, I was just going to add, I mean, fortunately, um, as, as concerning as I, I know I sounded like in panic earlier, the city of Atlanta, the Atlanta City Council, uh, was open to um, being informed. And, and one of the reasons the Atlanta PACE program hasn't gone forward yet is the city council said we have to have strong consumer protections built in, and we're not there yet. And as I think I mentioned earlier, one of the reasons we're not there yet is the, um, you know, we're encouraging provisions as strong and then some over California, and the, the private entity that wants this to go forward is concerned that they won't then be able to make enough money. Hmm. Um, so it's, I mean, it's, it's, it, it's, it's, that's a problem. Uh, and then while, while the legislation that's moving in Georgia, we, you know, we're still, obviously we're in the midst of session and, and it's not resolved, but at least when the, um, Senate added on uh, disaster recovery and broadband, they did include language that the Department of Community Affairs would draft community uh, consumer protection standards. Obviously, we're in conversation about that. We'd like to have the standards be spelled out and not drafted later before this goes through. But, you know, it's particularly concerning that the intent of PACE was, I mean, by its name, property assessed clean energy, and now we have a state, without really understanding the risks, tweaking that to include really vulnerable people who've just who are trying to recover from the hurricane so that that educating the the lawmakers um, while the bureau is taking steps to adopt um, standards uh, it's it's critically important you're absolutely right Maureen thank you Okay, we've been vocal with this, <laughs> but are there other additional questions that you have? That because I know you're focusing on ability to repay. I think we're pretty um, in unison that we think ability to repay is very important, but we have obviously an onslaught of additional issues. But I don't know if you have any additional questions for us that we didn't hit upon. <laughs> So, so I think a lot of our questions um, that we would ask of you are built into the ANPR. Mm -hmm. I think it's going to be critical for us to understand what's happening on the ground, not only from the industry perspective, but from the state and local government perspective, and from folks like yourselves. Um, it, it's, it's an essential uh, uh, vantage point, and we actually do take it really seriously. In particular, you know, if there are particular programs like we discussed, you know, that, that could uh, intermingle with issues that we're going to have to grapple with during our rulemaking, that would be essential to learn. If there are other financial products like the, you know, the property tax loans in Texas or other financial products that could satisfy, at the state level, excuse me, that could satisfy the statutory definition of pay, pace financing, that would be incredibly useful. Um, you know, at this point, we're trying to understand who does what currently, uh, you know, um, in, in the PACE financing process, who's responsible for setting standards, what are risks and benefits to consumers, um, and to communities as a whole. So all of that information is, is, uh, is going to be useful to us moving forward. 
Well, thank you very much. Thank you. This was um, very interesting and um, definitely a lively conversation. We thank you for your time. Thank you. Um, next, we will have staff from the Bureau's Office of Service Member Affairs come and speak with us. So we're going to just wait a minute till they get situated, and then we will continue. Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started again. So I'd like to welcome staff from the Bureau's Office of Service Member Affairs who are here to talk with us about their work to protect service members in the marketplace and also demo a financial education tool called Misadventures in Money Management. I'll now turn the meeting over to James Rice, Assistant Director for the Bureau's Office for Service Member Affairs, Patrick Campbell, Deputy Assistant Director for the Bureau's Office for Service Member Affairs, and Michelle Glass, Financial Education Program Analyst for the Bureau's Office of Service Member Affairs. Thank you for joining us, and now I'll turn the discussion over to you. Hey, Director, ladies and gentlemen, thanks for the opportunity to, to listen to us this afternoon and, and give us the opportunity to give you a presentation on some of the work that OSA does, in particular the misadven misadventures in money management. Uh, not everyone envies the last, uh, por last speaking portion of the day. Uh, we do, because we want, we want to leave you with, with the impression, with our impression of a, a, an important tool that, that, that should be in everyone's toolkit. Uh, anyone who serves service members, veterans, family members, uh, National Guard and Reserve, active duty, uh, the, in the entire panoply. So our agenda this afternoon, uh, already introduced the members introduced the members of the team who are here this afternoon uh, we are from the office of service member affairs uh, we are briefly going to talk about what the office does but we're going to focus our our presentation here this afternoon on the misadventures in money management we're going to give you time uh, to discuss ask any questions that you have and thank you again for the opportunity to listen to this presentation and to take this tool with you use it and spread the word about misadventures in money management uh, and I do take ownership for all my slides, and I, they, they assure me that it's just a coincidence that the, uh, the random picture that was selected involves uh, a soldier who has a lien on his back. You got it from the ODF. <laughs> As you can see, the Office of Service Member Affairs works to improve the financial well-being of family, family members veterans, soldiers from the time they are enter the delayed entry program through the time they are veterans. It includes active duty, National Guard, and Reserve. And the three main bullets that you see here involve educating and empowering those service members and their families to make better informed decisions. And that's what that tool that you're going to see this afternoon is all about. Monitoring and analyzing consumer complaints is another important facet of the Office of Service Member Affairs. Uh, we gather that information. We meet with, uh, with interagency groups. Uh, with soldier advocates, service member advocates, uh, people who can solve the problems of these service members along the lifetime of their engagement in, with the services. And we can co coordinate consumer protection with measures with those other federal agencies and state agencies. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to, uh, to Patrick, who, in, order, in, in addition to being the deputy, was the acting director of the office for, uh, I think, about nine or ten months uh, and, and did an excellent job in keeping all of the uh, all the crystal balls in the air uh, and, and letting none of them shatter. Uh, Patrick, I'll turn it over to you. None that you've found so far. So let me sweep those under the rug. Um, so some of the more recent accomplishments that we've had with the Office of Service Member Affairs, we actually had the honor of organizing a director visit to Travis Air Force Base, where she got to go meet with service members who were getting financial education training meet with the financial educators who were providing that training, and meet with key stakeholders on the base that were providing financial services. So it could be the financial coaches, the JAG officers. We even met with the chaplain um, to talk about issues that they were facing. And, you know, first trip, first first base visit, we were, we were very happy. And I know the director feels very strongly about doing outreach and doing um, education. So thank you for that. Uh, we also, in January, published an annual report that identifies emerging issues and continuing trends that we see in the, um, the marketplace. Um, some issues that we see are new security clearance rules that make it more important than ever for service members to you know, make sure that what their credit reporting history reflects what they're actually doing. Um, a series of debt collection issues. So credit reporting and debt collection are our top two issues that we receive complaints about and student loans. 
Um, we also work very closely with our partner agencies, the Department of Education, uh, Department of Defense, Dep Department of Veterans Affairs. We actually just got out of a meeting with all of the JAG attorneys um, from all the different services in the Department of Justice, um, where we talked about just different issues and different cases that they're seeing on the ground, um, anywhere from privatized housing to, um, you know, people who are, were in an, you know, they were telling this case where someone um, had an, um, were told that they could spend three months um, delaying, their house was hit by the hurricane and they could spend three months delaying their payment and then when they would started repayments again, um, they found that their home was foreclosed on. So this is the type of information sharing that we can share that someone on the ground, a Marine, was dealing with that we can hear about and we can do something about. And then we work very closely to create financial education materials. Um, you know, like, like everyone, financial products can really help um, service members do the things that you need to do. Move to a new city uh, or a country, fund an education, buy a home, start a family, or even handle those unexpected bumps in the road. But for those people who have served, they know that you know, your life is a little unique. You move a lot. And so when financial issues kind of go off the tracks, they can really start to spiral out of control. And I can speak from personal experience that you know, when I was deployed downrange and I started getting debt calls from my student loan collector, it's really hard to focus um, on guard duty, especially when you're up late at night, um, when you're really worried about how am I going to pay that debt or what was that debt they were even calling about in the first place. Um, we know that um, somewhere between four to 8,000 service members lose their security clearance every year due to financial issues. So this has a profound effect on the service members, um, their families, the units that are losing them, and it costs the government almost upwards of $450 million per year just to replace them. So this not only is this an issue for them, but it's also a big cost to the government. So, you know, when, when the office first stood up in 2011, we went and met with all the senior leaders um, across, you know, across the different services. And they told us they were very concerned about service members getting in financial trouble, especially when it comes in relation to impulse purchases like cars and TVs and phones. So how many of you ever... Um, been on a military base, lived on a military base, been to a military base. Director, I know you have, you know, who else? Um, been, been, been on a military base. Next time, if you ever get a chance to go to a military base, I want you to take what I call the, the Dodge Challenger Challenge. Um, and that is, you know, to count the number of young service members, you know, E1, E2s, that are driving up in souped up sports cars or these like monster truck type things where the tires are literally bigger than you are. Um, when I was in Jacksonville recently, there, it, was, it was early in the morning, I went for a run, and most of the people there were doing a PT test, and there was this one guy who was driving a monster truck with a seven-foot wheels. And, and all, all the whole time I could think was, you know, enjoy the car now, because that's going to be up on a platform as they repossess it later, because there's no way this E1 or E2 can afford this car. And so the senior leader said, you know, these are the mistakes that they made. These are the mistakes that they see their service members are making. How can we help them? What tools can we give them to help, you know, make it so that they avoid these mistakes and really can get on with their careers? And this was the genesis for us to come back and say, all right, how can we, what intervention can we make? And that was the creation of misadventures and money management. And now I want to introduce you to Michelle Glass, who is basically who runs our award-winning misadventures and money management. She is really the, the focus point for everything. Thank you, Beth. I want to give you a little bit of history about misadventures and money management. As you can see on this screen, this is a history of where we've been. In 2014, we began development of the misadventures program. We had focus groups after many, many months of research. We talked with those who are in the delayed entry program. We talked to senior enlisted members. We wanted to get their feedback about what would be the best vehicle to deliver financial education to them. And that was the genesis of where we came up with this concept of a virtual graphic novel with video bookends to introduce them to a character of storytelling with different characters throughout the program. And so our focus was on 17 to 21 year olds. So it had to be enticing to them. They told us they did not want big words. Comedy was great. And they didn't want anyone to stand up and lecture them with death by PowerPoint. So we took all of that feedback and this is how we came up with the design for Misadventures in Money Management. In 2016, we launched the program slowly, a pilot program with the Army the Army's delayed entry, and then later on that year we brought on the Navy and the Air Force, and then in 2017 we expanded it to include all delayed entry, including the Coast Guard and the National Guard. 
And then in 2018, we expanded it to Army ROTC. Now this year, we're preparing to roll it out because we were asked by senior leadership that this is working well. We've seen results with our delayed entry. We'd like to roll it out to those service members who reach their first duty station. So that's what we're preparing for now. And then in 2020, what we'd like to do is consider maybe rolling it out to the family members of service members as well as veterans. So that's the history of MIM. And now I'd like to give you a video of it and it'll be something to kind of wake you up. So <laughs> let's see if we can start this video so that you can see what the future service members see when they first get introduced to the program. So this introductory will show you um, one of the um, introductory videos to the program. So let's take a look at that now. Ugh. Did things go wrong with these service members? Several friends signed up for military service and made bad choices with their money. Choices that could have been prevented. Now Angela struggles to simply buy groceries. Uh, you could try a credit. Thank you, Mr. Self-Esteem. Uh, sorry. Didn't know it was a sensitive subject. You know, why do I have to buy all 12 eggs? Can't I buy just, like, seven? And now Cruz's financial life revolves around his expensive new car. Sandwich. Thanks. I thought you were going to make money in the military. With, like, money for food and, you know, a future. But this car is really cool. Dirk, of the top five money mistakes that service members make, he made all five. Whoa! He decided to live like a king on an 18-year-old's money and managed to for a very short time. Hello? Dirk, this is the Carlson Collect... No, uh, not the... That short time created a financial hole that he hey. may never get out of. Oh, really? Come on! And this is Maya, years from now, at age 23, after deciding to leave the military. Despite receiving several promotions, not only did she arrive home and have to move back in with her parents, she had to move back in with her parents. Milky. We're using a hotspot right now, so... She did. She lost her clearance because she didn't address the financial issues that took place. So while we're waiting for our hotspot to get back started, let me just see if this will play again. What I wanted to do was um, show you a, um, a demonstration of the actual tool. But um, while we're waiting for the hotspot, because I'll need the internet to do that, um, I do know I wanted to thank the members who had already gone out to mem.gov because I heard from several of you last night that you had already experienced it and I got some really good feedback and so I did take that feedback to heart so thank you members who actually went out to the site to look at the tool. Um, and so one of the things that you did notice when you're out there is that you know you do go through the video animation and then once you go through that that character, that live person, morphs into a comic book character. So if you look at your packet, you'll notice that I included this it's... comic book. And that comic book shows you how these real people actually morph into a comic book type character. So we included that in the packet for you. And those who are in the audience that also need a copy, we're also available to send you a copy of that as well. So, Move back in with her parents. Milkies. <laughs> okay. We did try this six times this morning, so. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Milkies. Oh, it's 10 p.m. Time. All right. Okay. So we'll give up. We'll move forward from that. 
But anyway, at this time, uh, Chairwoman, we'd like to open it up for questions with one of the questions um, that we included in that list being how can we expand or get the word out about misadventures and money All those years. To, um, to people around the country. Let me just close it. Can I just ask a first question because I think you said a lot of people did talk to you. Just a show of hands, how many people did go out? Did pretty much everybody go? So, so it's unfortunate that we didn't get to see it, but I think hopefully everybody really does know how it works and we all did get an opportunity to look at it. So I don't think that's affecting our discussion today. So and actually, good. Uh, funny that this happened. That actually one of the reasons why people had asked us why we didn't do all video um, was because um, we were worried that people might be in low internet situations, especially when they're overseas. And so we actually chose the comic book format because it was, you had just these short kind of one minute videos and then you transition to a very kind of low level, um, you know, you know, comic book, which is much easier to load when you're deployed. Now, funny, three years later, it's much easier to get internet, and now that now everyone expects videos. And so we're actually for future gener for future ones, we're going to be doing more more video laden characters. And one other thing I did want to mention is that we designed this program to work on mobile devices, and I know that was a comment that came up earlier. But this particular program, that was one of the very important pieces of feedback that we got from that age group, 17 to 21, that they wanted something that they could do on their mobile device. So this program actually works on mobiles, laptops, um, iPads, any type of mobile device, it's available to work for them. And, and you don't have to log in to the DOD, um, DOD system. I mean, I know, you know, you have to change your password every 90 days in the DOD and like people would rather you know, clean their toilets and change their password, you know, like, and, it, and so the fact that you can log into the system, get your completely on with your Gmail account is one of the best features of this because you can get it literally from anywhere. Mm -hmm. So to reframe up your question right now is how do we get these materials out to consumers? Is that yes. what you're looking for? Yes. How do we get the word out to let people know that it is available, that they can go to mem.gov and there's, you know, it's there, it's, it's ready, ready for them to use. Sharp sure. Manning. Um, so thank you for doing this, by the way. This, I think this is fantastic. Um, you, you know, of a, uh, I work for a company called Acorns, and of our 5 million investors, we significantly over-index to people in the service. And so um, we, we, we don't, I mean, we do a lot of our own educational content, or, uh, but we don't do anything specific to this segment. And so I'd love to follow up and, and understand ways in which we could help you reach this segment um, through what we do. But also, are there any insights or, or unique kind of points to their situation that would also help us maybe even think about product solutions? So unique insights that we've that we've learned through through the developing this training. Or, or just with the needs of this segment in general relative to their financial health and things things that we could do to potentially even like develop product around this because it's 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 a big enough population that you know there's a good business case for it um, and I think you know the way in which at least our organization thinks about developing product is education and product development kind of go hand in hand they aren't separate distinct efforts I, I know Michelle probably has you know feelings about this but I've you know one of the things that we heard loud and clear is that the advice you know any type time, time you talk to people like you can't really tell people like hey it's good to research something you you know they're, they're, these are people who are being told that, you know every day they wake up they have a checklist i'm going to shave i'm going to you know put my uniform i'm going to you know do my boots well they don't have boots anymore that they have to polish but basically everything is by a checklist and so it, you can't really you have to be very direct and very clear about what each next step is. And so people who kind of thrive on that. And so making sure that whatever you do develop has that very clear, like, do X, do Y, do Z, um, that, that'll, you know, bode well in the military. Mm -hmm. Right. And make sure it's clear, plain language, definitely use plain language. And they were telling us, like, some of the resources that we made for them, they told us, you know, at the CFPB, you have really good resources, but you're very text heavy. And sometimes we don't understand what you're saying. So they told us if, like, for example, if we create a fact sheet for them, they said, don't list 10 things, just give us three things. That's all we want to see is those three things and then move on. So that just enough, just in time information is what they want. They'll tell them everything they have to know, but give them what they need right now at that particular moment when they're about to make a decision. I just want to give feedback. I, you know, I applaud this, and and I think to the point that 
um, we saw some of the financial education earlier. I think this is the media. Um, you know, my daughter learns how to make slime on, on YouTube, right? That's how that generation is now learning. And they're not learning by going to a website and, and reading anymore. You have to push it to them in a video uh, capacity. So I just wanted to comment uh, really focusing on, on how that age group is learning. Um, it, it, kudos. Yeah. Hi. Yeah. I uh, <clears throat> just wanted to comment and say that the material looks great, and all the scenarios in there are fantastic and are very relevant to um, the service members that we serve uh, at our credit union. And if uh, maybe just recommendation for future content, if you develop more scenarios, you know, we see a lot of our uh, service members um, have been targeted with online romance scams, and so as they're um, <clears throat> in, you know, traveling, they're engaging in, in online dating, and and uh, you know, it's exceptionally hard for our uh, financial service representatives to have to have those conversations with them that you've been scammed. Um, and so, you know, just in, in future iterations of this, it might be something to consider in protecting our service members uh, from those types of uh, financial events. So. Thank you. Brett. Uh, our foundation worked with the National Military Family Association and later FINRA Foundation on money and mobility. So this is a constant inflection point of money decisions and new orientation to money, you're forced to capture that attention. So I think that's a, that's a place to expand and inject this. And I know uh, there's, there are new people at FINRA Foundation and they may want to update this material. And I think there may be ways we can share some of the key messaging from that, keep it down to three or just a few points. I'd be happy to facilitate that kind of uh, interaction. Also, uh, some of the unique features of military service include if, if one's in a combat zone, tax-free or, you know, there's like an inflation of revenue, yep. of, of pay that comes in that is not sustainable. And uh, pointing out those unique challenges and then always trying to connect back to the CFPB mission as it relates to civilian knowledge. So, you know, this is a continual source once you separate from the military. Uh, as well as protection while you're in the military for complaints, but also continued guidance throughout your life. Jason. Um, you know, one of the things that I, I really like about this is um, how you're um, leveraging the power of storytelling. Um, how, uh, you know, uh, Talking about these, um, you know, potential uh, financial traps or mishaps um, uh, in the context of, you know, uh, a story or something that's that's more sort of engaging and memorable, um, I think can be really effective. Um, you know, some other strategies that come to mind uh, in terms of um, other ways to get the message uh, out there and have it resonate and stick. Um, you know, particularly when we're talking about a younger demographic. So mobile optimized is great. Um, you know, you're, you're dealing with consumers that are more digitally native. Um, but, you know, I think also in addition to storytelling, you know, you can think about the other ways that uh, consumers today uh, are used to taking in information. Um, it's almost like if you study what BuzzFeed is doing and the different ways that they format and deliver content, um, there's some really interesting ideas there. You know, so things to think about are, uh, you, know, you mentioned checklists. Um, simple checklists uh, can be really engaging. How-to guides, um, the guide to buying your first car, uh, for instance. Um, quizzes and interactive tools, they can be pretty low fidelity. So, I mean, BuzzFeed really grew um, with uh, you know their their early sort of quiz product, and you know it's not uh, super technically sophisticated, but it is interactive, um, and it allows the user to sort of customize um, their experience. Um, and then you know another simple thing is you're producing more video. Um, something that that we do when we produce video content is uh, we create things in a way that they can be cut down easily into more bite-sized videos. So produce a one or two minute, uh, you know, full full video that is m sort of modular, and then you know it's very easy to put those videos out on other channels like YouTube, for instance. Just just if, if, 
Just I did you read our playbook? Because that, that, <laughs> that, literally Michelle is working on you know the rucksack, which is a series of interactive quizzes just like that, and we are actually working on a series of videos that we're going to put on the Armed Forces Network. So you know, when you're overseas, you get you know you don't get you get free TV, but you know they can't show normal paid commercials, so they have to fill that space. And and so we're working on a whole bunch of you know videos um, where we can just put them out and and get them free distribution. So. You're right on in where we're going, so thank you. Arlene? Um, coming from a, um, a past military spouse experience, um, I found these very, very applicable to those real-life situations. So um, he, he kind of alluded to it before about the social media sites where people go to pretty regularly YouTube. But um, something that has worked in our credit union in terms of um, getting training um, input into employees that are really short in nature. We've used um, what we call brain sharks, and they're about a two-minute video, but it tells you what you need to know about a certain subject, and then you have another series that kind of build on that one. But I think what has helped um, tremendously in that is once they tell you to go watch a video, the first thing you look at is how long it will take you for you to determine um, you know, you can prioritize your day around it or whatever. And I think just looking at something and going, okay, this is three minutes, I can do that, um, has proven to be very, very successful. And I could see these further breaking down into those short snippets that could be very impactful. Yeah, and I was just curious too, do you require people to register and subscribe for for the video content, or is it something you can push? I mean, could you could I just subscribe using an email address, and any new content is pushed? You know, almost like the YouTube version. The registration piece just threw me a little bit, and I wasn't exactly following that. Yeah. So. Okay. Can you hear me? Okay. So when you get to the site, there is a <coughs> registration, but the only thing you need is an email and a password. Once you type that in, you're into the system. And then, of course, you know, we do have like a pre-assessment and then on the back in a post-assessment. But once you get that, you're in there and you can see those characters. Now, as we develop new characters, those will be automatically added to your feed if they apply to your particular situation. So, yes, you'll automatically get any new content, any new resources. All of that will be automatically on the system. And, and just for what it's worth, um, one of the things we're working on is an app um, so that you know, like I said, people don't like passwords, right? And so um, if you have it as an app, you're kind of removing that first initial step that you can kind of stay logged in. Um, one of the things we had hoped was that the Department of Defense would pro offer promotion points for completing this. So in order to do that, you have to have, you know, you have to make sure that you know the person who is actually doing it. You can't just have everyone print out certificates. So um, with that in mind, um, you know, we're working with the different services to possibly require this as part of their mandatory training. And so you know, that, that, that's why we have that link. But we understand that that was one of the first things that when we tested it was, why do I have to log in? And right. so if we're trying to reduce the friction to get into the, into the program so that people can, you know, I'd much rather just log into my Amazon app. I know I'm not supposed to endorse anything, right? right? Like I, but just like me personally, like, you know, then I, I'd rather go on the Amazon app than, than actually log in through the website because then I don't have to put in my password every time. So um, I loved everything about this material. I mean, for someone, I've spent a lot of my life educating consumers on responsible financial services, and this is sort of the second piece, you know, that, that you need because the product really does a big part to help these consumers. It is the education and this kind of interactive uh, material. So I, I, I really enjoyed the fact that you could go back. You, it's not a video that's going constant and you have to stop it and go back. You can go at it at, at your pace. You know, one thought that I had is perhaps um, going to some of the trade associations that have a network of whether it's financial institutions, credit unions, and the people here can talk more, or others that are focused on serving this, this um, consumers, um, because they're always looking for ways to engage with their customers, right, and provide additional value beyond the product solutions that they sell. And um, I think that's the tool for the salespeople in those organizations, as well as adding value to their consumers in a consultative sales approach. Um, so um, I also thought about it. There's a lot in here that's not necessarily 
service members that need, can, could be used for other populations. So the one on credit building, I immediately thought about, you know, your minority, your immigrant population, your millennials. Um, so there, I think there's a lot of applicability here for, for other segments. I also uh, applaud this, and I think everybody here has heard me already plug our our app, basic training. Um, but one of the things that we built into it was the ability, specifically because the scams are constantly evolving. One of you mentioned the romance scams. We have the ability to send, um, it has to be enabled, but send a notification if there's a new scam that they get through their app on their phone. Um, I, I, in terms of, I think your first question was how do we get this information out to people? And you didn't say service members. And I'm automatically thinking about you know, when we developed our guide and app, it was the spouses. And, you know, of course, there are networks of military spouses. And sometimes that's an easier path to the service member um, because they're going to be, oh, honey, I just heard about this. And, gee, why don't, why don't we watch it together? Um, if one of the, the um, we worked, I think, as you all know, with our, our state attorney general and Department of Law. And a key component of our guide that you all might want to consider is we were able to take the new, you know, the, the, the new DOD MLA regs, thanks to your, with a lot of help from you, Peter, so thank you, um, but adapt it specific to Georgia code where there are different, different elements. You know, our, for example, our um, car lemon laws are different in Georgia. So we, we actually customized it for, for service members who are on our installations in Georgia. Um, so I'm, I'm sure other AGs would love to work with you on something like that. And that's another path to getting information into the installations through the AG's office. Um, uh, I, um, we, 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 like you, we did focus groups and found that service members really want it very simple. So we created 13 different infographics that are still very relevant. And it's got, like you, the, the sort of cartoony and bright colors and, you know, just... Um, Visuals. Everybody likes the infographics now, and so you know. I think you're probably doing some of that. And then um, finally, um, if you're able to get real, you know, these are powerful in the video. These, but these are actors. Um, we have found that we we can find consumers who are willing to actually share because they want to protect other consumers. And sometimes there is that initial. I'm embarrassed. I'm ashamed this happened to me. But when you, but we have really found a lot of consumers who are willing to say, no, this isn't just a, this isn't a training exercise. This is my life, and this is how it affected my life. And I'm telling you this so that you can maybe learn uh, and um, and 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 follow some of the advice in this um, in this tool. Yeah, we we totally agree with that statement. And actually, in our annual report, we use narratives from people because I think. You can write, you know, a couple paragraphs about an issue, but you know, someone can just say in two or three sentences what what the issue was. I mean, we had one um, lieutenant colonel from from Louisiana who, you know, had a debt from the VA on his credit report. And he was he was going up for a full bird and he came knocking on his door saying the security clearance was going to be revoked, um, and he didn't even know about it. And it's just because they had the wrong address, and he um, he paid the debt on time, but the VA never cashed the check. And so um, I am happy to report that he did come by last week and say that uh, the debt has been re relieved. It's still not off his credit report yet, but, um, but the VA did admit their mistake. But that, that one story was able to crystallize the whole kind of issue that we would have taken pages to talk about. So I, we totally agree. And we have a couple of consumer stories. We used to do that a lot um, at the beginning of the Bureau. I think we definitely can do more of it. Thank you. So I see this, too, with multiple opportunities um, beyond the service members. I mean, what's going through my head, too, is we were talking earlier about financial literacy. And I know, at least in, um, and this might be a little bit advanced for elementary school, but the concept of it could be tailored to that level. And um, I know, at least in my county, um, the children in elementary school and their requirements, I think, lessen as they get older, but they have to spend a certain amount of time online. We have a program called My On and there's some other similar ones. And I could see this um, partnering with school systems to have, it, it's helping them read, but they're also learning a second lesson along with it. So I see that as a, a huge opportunity. And I also see this as tying in to the, um, the Start Small. I think that there's a lesson there for that that could be at any, it could be for elementary school, middle school, service members. I mean, I think this concept is um, 
is impactful and it's quick enough, but the message is very direct and it, it can really help on so many different levels. Any other comments? Yes. Um, just in the spirit of sort of brainstorming, um, another thing that comes to mind uh, that we can learn from kind of other consumer behavior, um, particularly on the internet, is that um, peer to peer advice and conversation can be really powerful. Um, so if you think about uh, the people that get financial advice from Reddit or from other online forums, um, not endorsing that as uh, the right source for financial information, but in tighter knit communities um, like military families, uh, you could imagine fostering conversation um, within those communities around topics um, like personal finance. We call, we call them barracks lawyers, um, um, but yeah, I mean, I, th I think that, you know, mo we, as we know, that most people get their feedback from their friends. I mean, that's the first stop. And so if you can kind of help that one person who is you know, kind of studying, giving them the tools, then you, you're not only influencing them, but you're influencing their network. And I do read the mil military finance um, subreddit um, just because there's all sorts of really great stories, and it's... It validates our work because you know pretty much every day one of the issues that we talked about in our report. I'm like, oh, there's another one. I keep sending to my staff. So. Again, I, I, I truly appreciate what you've done, and I think that it could also be modified more broadly for uh, college students, especially um, uh, including. Um, to your college students, especially given the, the push for up skills um, and, and, and this country. Um, but in addition to the, um, the college student community, within the college student community, uh, there is ROTC and NROTC and all of those guys and the women um, that um, this, they, they would definitely benefit from, from seeing this video, including, of course, uh, Coast Guard as well. Um, because those programs um, provide um, uh, significant compensation to the students while they're in um, in school, and uh, and they will then wind up going and buying the big wheel vehicle and all the rest of that uh, while they're in school, and then come out and then they got a, uh, they have a problem. So I think that getting into the, the university systems, the Tarazzi and Razzi um, and other. Um, um, uh, programs is important, but also working to get the same type of video uh, to college students and whether they're two year schools or four year schools. We just got we just got good news from the Navy ROTC. So we you know we, we heard from the Army and we heard from the Marines, but we hadn't heard from the Navy ROTC. So just yesterday they sent it out to all of the, the campuses um, to put it on the curriculum, not mandatory, but at least to make it available. So it, you know, you're you're right. That's exactly where where we're going. But you know there are plenty of opportunities for us to expand to you know other other populations, college students. You know make make total sense. Though I often agree with my colleagues, um, the one thing I would caution you on on that particular point, because I do think the content is really good and I think it's very um, approachable, but if you generalize it too much, you lose all of the relevancy. And so I, I, I would, if I encourage you expanding the scope of the program, I would actually, as you build out your video strategy and your quiz strategy, to actually be very segmented in that as opposed to genericizing it. Um, and I think the other idea to build on kind of what Jason was saying is if, if you get to the point where there are some type of promotion points, and I'm going to pretend like I understand that, but, um, <laughs> but if you get to a point where that uh, is actually implemented, I would also highly encourage you to have a referral program for people that are in the program to get, you know, to increase the reach so, so that they could get other service member in to participate and get the benefit of the content. That's wonderful. Thank you. One of the things that we have been doing is trying to encourage competition because you know the services love competition. And if you go, some of you have already done this, but if you go to the mem.gov website, you'll notice we have a new leaderboard up there. And it shows who's the top in participation and who's the, the highest in completion rates. And that's something they take very, very seriously.
So Patrick sends out a report once a month to all the enlisted senior enlisted leaders and some of the recruiters who are using the program. And we get a lot of feedback from them saying, um, are, are you sure my numbers are right? I think they I have more. They do not like the fact that Marines are beating everyone. It just, <laughs> that does not, does not sit well with all the other services. Yeah. So. Well, you know, another way you can use um, points to perhaps encourage um, uh, commanders, but also um, state senators, um, if you tie the, your uh, promotion points to BRAC points and states that have a, a, um, service members um, with high um, MEM scores, it can be an, an additional score for, um, for BRAC. Uh, I think you'll find um, lots of adoption across the states. I can imagine we would have universal adoption Indeed. if we did that. <laughs> Well, thank you very much for that informative presentation and discussion. Um, I would like to thank Director Craninger, Acting Director Johnson, Acting Deputy Director Johnson, Andrew Duke, Matt Cameron, all of the Bureau staff, and all of the Advisory Committee members for today's important meeting and discussion. We, I think, on both sides, we've all learned a lot and have a lot of good takeaways from today. Um, I'm looking forward to continuing to build on our work with the Bureau and helping to play a role in its mission to serve and protect consumers. This meeting is now adjourned. Have a wonderful afternoon and safe travels back home, and I guess we will all reconvene in June. Thank you.